Everybody, how's it going? Hey, we made it to fifty-one now. I know. <laughs> well, I'm, the anniversary. I'm, I'm just off. about sobered up again after last after last week's <laughs> one. So, time to put that right. Cheers. Mm. Good times. Fifty-one. I know. Old. I don't feel fifty-one. Not yet, anyway. Mm. Even if I look it, but you know. Um, hey. It's good to be here, though, and it's another week, and it's another, well, another round of silly stuff going on, so <laughs> yep. we've got plenty of things we can point and laugh about, so it seems like a, a good time to get started. What do you think? Oh, I love that idea. All right. Well, the bar is open, and hello to everyone in chat who's joining us tonight. We'll see. There seems to be quite a few people here already, so we'll see how many we get to, but we should bring in a few of our guests, I reckon, so we can get this started properly. It's not a drinking party unless we've got more people to drink with, although I've done mm. it by myself plenty of times, you know. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, first up, we have got Mr. Chris Gore making his return to the open bar. Hey, man. Hey. Thanks, drinker. Good to see you, Mahler. Howdy. What's happening? Good to have you back. Uh, yeah, it's uh, you, you've uh, you've been on a few times recently, actually. So it's it's awesome to have you. Um, you're our, our like guy on the inside because you get to see a lot of things before we do. So it's always interesting to hear your takes on stuff. Well, uh, I, only because I've been around so long. It's because I'm so <laughs> freaking old. Been around the industry, and you know, I think certain studios forgot to take me off their lists. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, I'll be yeah blacklisted the last I think the last time you were on, we talked about how you'd seen, or you're going to see 65. I feel like you and I are now the only people who've seen that film, maybe. Yeah. <laughs> well, um, if you look at the box office, yeah, that's about right. But uh, yeah, no, uh, for the, I saw The Flash, and we'll talk about it later, but I snuck into a fan screening of it. So I'll tell you about it later, but uh, mm, I can't wait nice. to discuss The Flash with you guys. All right. Well, anyway, we'll uh, we'll bring in some of more of our guests uh, so we can carry on. So we have got Echo Chamberlain making his return as well to the open bar. It's our friend from was it New Zealand or Australia? You're in. It's New Zealand. New Zealand. It? Yeah. All right. Same right. thing. That ungodly <laughs> place at the edge of nowhere. <laughs> yeah, pretty much. Well, I'm uh, I'm a little annoyed and I'm a little ticked off. You know, it's a cost of living crisis. It hasn't been easy. I spent a year scrimping and saving so I could have the $5,000 to go to the Galactic Star Cruiser Hotel. Oh, and now I can't. Right. Plus, it was the $2,000 of uh, airplane tickets it was going to cost. I wanted my small windowless bedroom. I wanted to meet all my super faves like Kylo Ren. Uh, it was going to be like Westworld, except without the, the guilt-free sexual deviancy. So I didn't even have that. <laughs> uh, so I'm pretty down. There would be a lot of guilt to the sexual deviancy if you tried to the Star <laughs> Cruiser <Reserve> Hotel. <laughs> yeah. And lots of lawsuits, you know. Um, sure. Well, you've still got time, because I think it's still open until September, so... There you go. You might be all right, you know? You still meet yeah. Ray. Get her autograph. Yes! Imagine yeah. the fun that could be Imagine. had Imagine. Go to my super fave place, uh, Batu or whatever it's called. <laughs> I really I want to get do. the um, I want to get the the shuttlecraft from like the Galactic Star Cruiser Hotel uh, to Star Wars Land, and oh, it's yeah. just like a it's just a panel van with like the windows blocked up. <laughs> 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 it's just like the saddest thing. Yeah, like you're being driven to court. You know? Yeah, <laughs> I've been there plenty of times as well. So you know, I don't want to bring back bad memories. <laughs> Uh, we've uh, also got uh, Razorfist who's joining us shortly, but he's not quite here yet. But we just thought, what the hell? We're going to start without him because that's how we roll an open bar. And, you know, we started pretty much on time tonight, so I am impressed with did. us. Yeah, mm. that's, what, that's, what we, that's what you guys mean to us, chat. Mm -hmm. You know, we wanted, to, we wanted to be here for you immediately and not keep you waiting. So there you go. We sacrificed one of our own. It wasn't at all that he was desperate to start drinking. That wasn't it. It was it was you guys. You guys <laughs> well, at home. Okay. I can drink at any point. I don't need an audience for it. <laughs> <laughs> I just have a tap directly to my stomach. It's all good. 
But hey, but we might as well uh, get fired right into this. And well, I guess there's a lot of stories competing for our attention in terms of failures in Hollywood. But uh, the one that seems to be dominating the headlines at the moment is Indiana Jones and the Dial of Destiny, because the the geniuses at Lucasfilm and Disney uh, decided to screen it at Cannes Film Festival um, at least a month, or more than a month, in fact, before it actually releases cinematically. Uh, and they lifted the review embargo, and everyone got a chance to get, give their real thoughts on the movie. And those thoughts weren't great. I mean, I've got some of the... <laughs> it's currently sitting at 51% on Rotten Tomatoes. Um, and I think amongst the top rated critics it's about 36 percent uh let's see Oof. what's the rating amongst them uh yeah um and if i could just read a couple of the the highlights of this um we've got one here from what we got this isn't the goodbye that harrison ford deserves uh and that is from <laughs> wait a minute who's this from uh yeah film companion uh, the Observer says, fun isn't the most accurate way to describe its excessive antics. There's never a dull moment, but all the globetrotting hullabaloo does verge on exhausting. Uh, the Toronto Star says, it's all pretty goofy and laborious over its 142-minute running time. Um, what else have we got? Polygon says, it's a disappointing facsimile of the much better Indiana Jones films that preceded it. Uh, and that's, if Polygon says it's bad, then damn, it must be really bad. It's kind of funny, because you'd be like, so are all of these reviews of uh, the fourth one or the fifth one? <laughs> like, yeah. Uh, yeah. Well, I think there was one, uh, I think it was IGN, in fact, that said, like, this does the almost impossible and makes us appreciate uh, Kingdom of the Crystal Skull a little bit more. <laughs> like, mm -hmm. I mean, that usually happens. The previous awful thing somehow looks better than the new awful thing. Mm -hmm. It is uh, Disney. They find a way. But it's an interesting position they find themselves in because if even the the corporate press, like the show critics, are turning against this, man, what is the audience reaction going to be when this hits the the cinemas? Because people are not normal. People are not going to hold back. Oh uh, yeah, and you have to assume like, well, if these guys have given it like fifty percent, the the audience rating is going to be probably around I don't know twenty percent. Because there's a lot of fans out there that are going to be really pissed off if this doesn't do, if this isn't good, and it just, really seems like it's not going to be. Who's excited for it anymore? It just feels like a dead film on arrival. I already thought it was going to be bad, but now after all these reviews, it's like, whoa, yeah. what are we in for? Well, I mean, it feels like it just had nothing but bad will towards it since the very start. You know, yeah. Nobody was enthusiastic about the whole concept of another indie film after um, Crystal Skull. The um, the fact that Harrison Ford was so much older now. Uh, the fact that they decided to bring in Phoebe Waller-Bridge as like his, his smart, sassy companion. We knew exactly what that was going to mean. Um, and yeah, no the, one then especially started... wanted to see it set in in this time period either. That's not the indie time period anyone associates with the aesthetic or spirit of the thing. Uh, not so that, that classic adventure period you know when when you've got him fighting nazis and stuff it's just it's very easy you know it's very simple mm -hmm. villains that you can hate immediately uh the, the, it got more complicated when they tried to move it forward into the 50s and then suddenly he's up against the soviets but like they mm -hmm. they they can't they couldn't really go all out and make them into evil bad guys like the nazis because you know Hollywood criticizing communism never. <laughs> this was back then. Um, God, they'd probably be the good guys at this point in, in Hollywood filmmaking. But um, yeah, like it created that problem of um, not having the kind of um, over the top cartoonish villains that you would expect from an adventure serial. Um, and then now, yeah, you're you're setting it in the late 1960s with uh, the moon landings and all the social changes of the 60s, you know, that doesn't fit with Indiana Jones. It's like you're just going out of your way to paint him as just this relic of a, a forgotten time. You know, that's that's not what we want to see him as. You're, I mean, you're never going to sell an indie movie like that. That just comes across like hack writing 101. It's like, our character is older now. What do we do? How about we have it that he's really old and out of sync with modern times and everyone thinks he's lame and he's going to fall over and he's going to 
do his classic things and they're not going to work and he's not going to understand the kids of today. It's going like, yeah, to be real fun. That's exactly what we want to see. Yeah. yeah, I mean, Harrison Ford can fit into that role of like grumpy <clears throat> old man for sure. <laughs> but like, that's, that's not necessarily what we want Indiana Jones to be. Uh, you want that old world's exoticism of you know that of that world that's just starting to fade of, of places like India and Egypt, and you want that combined a little bit with the Nazis and a, and a kind of new oppressive uh, nastiness as well. And you wanted that; it was just like this perfect balance. And I don't want where he's in a, in a essentially a modern world. There's yeah. no particular appeal there. I mean, when you see like places like Cairo in the 1930s. It yeah. just kind of screams adventure. Like it just seems yeah. like an awesome place. Like you've got the pyramids, mm -hmm. you've got this like thriving city with, you know, um, spies and and you know German soldiers and like all mm -hmm. kinds of like you know crazy shenanigans going down. It just feels like the kind of place that's um, tailor made for that sort of thing. It just yeah. lends itself to that that setting. Um, and yeah, this this doesn't. Um, there's another quote that uh, came from the BBC of all places, and damn, if they criticise something for being like too, I don't know, too feminist or too woke or something, you know, you've got problems. Um, but yeah, there's. <laughs> I'm not sure how many fans want to see Indiana Jones as a broken, helpless old man who cowers in the corner <laughs> while his patronising goddaughter takes the lead. But that's what we're given, and it's as bleak as it sounds. No, I mean. <laughs> That could almost that's... be perfectly interchangeable with Luke Skywalker on Craggy Island. Like, it's, you could that, literally that's what work like, that. Yeah. Um, when I, when I uh, kind of gave my summary of what this film is, like, you know, a, a past is prime hero with an insufferable sort of young female um, sidekick who's really the main character of the story. Uh, I was like, mm. this could be Force Awakens. It could be The Last Jedi. You know, it's all just the same concept. And yeah, I, I don't know... I don't really know what they were hoping to achieve with this one. When they look at how characters like Rey were received within the, the Star Wars universe and um, what became of those movies, you know, why why try and replicate that same idea here? It didn't work with Star Wars. It's not going to work this time around either. Like, people just don't want mm -hmm. that kind of thing. If you had a Phoebe Waller-Bridge character who, at the outset, is maybe... Um has no interest or appeal in archaeology but towards she has a character arc where by the end she begins to fall in love with the path that her grandfather had taken so you have you go from uh, innocence or naivety to inhabiting and, and experiencing the same love and devotion that would be an interesting arc but i think she's just going to start from the very beginning as a kind of know-it-all insufferable uh, speaking and and in, in banter with him and and so there's none of that there's just nothing there doesn't seem to be any appeal if I mentioned that uh, this recent Hollywood film I saw was soulless corporate garbage, would you even know what movie I was talking about? <laughs> nope. I mean, that's that's every movie from Disney at the moment. <laughs> every movie yeah. from Disney for sure. But yeah, like I, I think strategically, I think it was an incredibly stupid move to open this at Cannes more than you know six weeks. They timed it to the Monday after the screening. Tickets went on sale for Indiana Jones, and I can confirm that they are plentiful. It's the yep. screenings are not selling out. It's soft sales, I would say. But or the last Indiana Jones film, uh, Crystal Skull, that opened. It, it played at Cannes, and then four days later, it was in theaters. Strategically smart move, right? You get the whatever buzz you get out of Cannes, good or bad. And then it's in theaters. Most people don't pay attention. You now have six weeks of negative reviews, Rotten Tomato score that is going to, you know, that is below, you know, especially coming from critics who tend to suck up to Lucasfilm anyways. Um, yep. It was, this was a terrible, terrible move on their part. It almost, it almost feels like strategically Iger's trying to find a way to get rid of Kathleen Kennedy by throwing her under the bus. Uh, we'll have this open at can. It is bad. We know it's bad. It's it's all the things people are saying they hate about modern Hollywood filmmaking. And maybe he'll use it as an excuse to get rid of her. I doubt it. I'm not going to go down that path. Other people can. But but I, I how anyone thought this was a good idea, I, I, I can't say. It's, it was a terrible idea. 
to, to do that unless they were going to move up the release date or do fan screenings or whatever. What well, at this point, yeah, like at this point, Lucasfilm have now burned through all of their legacy properties. They have essentially killed Star Wars. They killed Willow because, you know, there was huge potential no. there. <laughs> and it seems <laughs> like they fucking killed Indiana Jones as well. Like, what have they got left now? They've got nothing. So they're, they're you know, 0 for 3 on these things and like at what point do you do you have to step in and say right enough of this you guys clearly have no clue what you're doing we need to clean house here and fire yeah, everyone and, who's made this happen and where's the sexy i mean i'm so sick of going to see hollywood films where they <clears throat> desexualize the women and then you've got oh. shirtless beefcake guys i'm so tired of this think of the first film which was raiders of the lost ark None of this BS, Indiana Jones and Raiders of the Lost Ark. It was Raiders of the Lost Ark was the name of that movie. They're trying to do this with the Mad Max films too. Uh, they're trying to say, you know, it's Mad Max and the Road War or whatever. They're rebranding to, to, to put Mad Max in all the titles of the films. Anyways, um, do you remember that shot of Marion on the, uh, the deck of the submarine in that skimpy outfit blowing where you can see her very visible triangular bush uh, <laughs> and look it's not like okay maybe maybe it was intended I, who knows all i'm saying is damn and how come we we, we don't see any of that in modern cinema well you in, in modern yeah you don't even get a hint of cleavage or anything like that now it's like they go out of their way to make the the women look as unappealing as possible like ooh, yeah. don't want that I, you know i get like some of the thinking behind it it's like okay maybe they've been exploited a little bit in the past but now it's like so overcompensated that it's just uh they're, they're just like amorphous blobs on screen they, they might as well oh. just be men and it doesn't help that they they have this tendency now to cast like these really like skinny androgynous looking actresses that have like no hips, no bust, no waist or anything. Like they're just kind of straight up and down, and it's like they're mo the most boring people to look at. Or, I remember or seeing, yeah, or, and, well, it's a it's a shame that women were exploited. Luckily, now with the ninety year old main star who shouldn't even be in action films, we're not exploiting <laughs> anyone anymore. Fortunately, that's over with, huh? <laughs> oh I feel God. like the audience is exploited at this point, <laughs> right? I I don't know what people are so bent out of shape about this. Uh, the new Indiana Jones movies allowed me to multitask. I can watch Indiana Jones and Jurassic Park at the same fucking time. I I, I don't get it. <laughs> well, at what point is it like abusing the elderly? You know, like do we need to check in on Harrison Ford? Like, were you forced into this, Harrison? Like, do you remember being in this film? <laughs> At gunpoint, I assure you. <laughs> Side the no, I don't, I don't get it. it. It's like, you, you think Harrison, I said on social media the other day, you think Harrison Ford's agent even remembers the word no? Like, I'm, <laughs> I'm sure they're paying him like the gross domestic product of Pakistan for his services or whatever, but you're, the guy's not even going to be alive to spend it. Like does yeah, yeah. does does Callista Flockhart really need that much cash? Like she certainly isn't spending it on food. What the fuck? <laughs> yeah. Uh, but I saw. I remember seeing the trailer of Ant Man and the Wasp, and they were side by side uh, in their suits, and their physiques were almost exactly the same. Uh, yeah. You know, the man and the female character. Uh, yeah. Jesus Christ. Well. It you know, it's like, uh, take something like Scarlet Witch from the MCU. When you first saw her, like, her, her costume was kind of revealing, like, give you a bit of cleavage and stuff, and mm -hmm. Elizabeth Olsen's pretty, pretty, uh, well built, you know, she fills it out quite nicely. And, yeah, like, with each passing movie, she apparently mandated that she wanted to be more covered up, and she didn't want to mm -hmm. be, um, uh, particularly because the dominoes had started to fall on that one, like, the other actresses were getting covered up as well, and you know, you had characters like Black Widow, which was, you know, she used her sexuality to her advantage to lure people into um, a false sense of security, which is part of her mystique as a character. By the end, it's like, no, she's just she just looks like a man, basically. You know, when you look at the final Black Widow movie, like her final appearance, she's just straight up and down. It's like they've somehow find a way to, like, compress her chest down so there's nothing there. She's got these stupid little shoulder pad things to try and make her... Uh, her shoulders look broader, like a man. Uh, mm -hmm. It's just all the same thing. And um, yeah, the result is they are just 
I don't know, man. It, it's like they just want to eliminate the whole concept of sensuality on screen. Uh, and that... Look at a scene like uh, in Empire Strikes Back, right? That scene between Han and Leia on the Millennium Falcon where she's trying to repair something and he kind of uh, corners her. Um, <laughs> rape! And... Rape! Yeah, well, you know, there's an interesting dynamic at play there, right? Because he's coming on right. to her pretty strong and she's protesting, but she kind of isn't really... If you know what I mean, you know, right. the, there's this this interesting <clears throat> dynamic of like sometimes a person can can put up a fight or they can they can put up resistance, but they kind of are interested. Um, and the that scene tackles it really well. But you and it there's it's very sexually charged as, as a result, and it's played really well by the two actors. You would never get a scene like that now. That would never be fucking allowed. No. Same with with uh, Deckard and and. Um, Oh my god! In Blade Runner, forget <laughs> that that yeah, bit where he slams it. the door when she's trying to leave, and like again, they get it on. But well, and and it's entirely because they had a normal love scene planned, and then the two stars hated each other, so they they were just frustrated after hours and hours of trying to get this shit to work. And there used to be like actual nudity in that scene, and like it was really uncomfortable because neither of them liked each other. So finally, Harrison Ford just steered into it, and the people on set actually called that scene the hate scene. <laughs> <laughs> well, it and works. Yeah, it, it works. It works fine. But again, like I, like I, the point I'm making is like uh, I, an interesting scene like that that you can read a lot into uh, wouldn't be allowed. It would have to be yeah. like 100% consensual or fight. If it was a movie now, like especially from Disney, it just wouldn't have any kind of sex scene or love scene in it. Because they just don't want that anymore. They just want everyone to be just a, a useless, amorphous blob of nothingness. Right? You know they don't trouble, even um, exist from, like, the neck down. Yeah, pretty much. You know how much trouble Game of Thrones got in? I think it was, like, season six. The uh, They had, when they like, deliberately portraying a negative sexual experience, they got in super trouble with, like, fans and different outlets and articles and stuff. Where, uh, I think it was Jamie and Cersei, they were having sex, like... Uh, it, it was unclear if she was into it, sort of thing, and it was like yeah. literally on their their son's corpse was near them. <laughs> it's a really fucked yeah, up scene, right. very deliberately fucked up. But people were like, "This is unacceptable. You cannot like have this." And it's like, it's fucking. This is a, <laughs> this is a show where people are getting like burned alive, <laughs> exactly. tortured, limbs hacked off, yeah, and it's yeah, like, yeah. "Ooh, non consensual sex. That's the line I cannot cross." And like, now I'm triggered. Yeah, uh, the the Actor, the actor actually said he was describing that scene, and he said that um, it's deliberately to show that these are two broken people. That was the whole point of that that sex scene. Oh, I thought that yeah, was so... fucking clear when you watched it, but some people like <laughs> no, he, he, he had to. Yeah, yeah, strange. Yeah, and then, and uh, then sadly, uh, was the, what happened to why am I forgetting a bloody name? The Stark, the not the youngest, the Sansa. one up from it. Sansa, that's it. She got a. She had a less than fun time with good old Ramsey, and that pissed mm. off everybody as well. And it's like, I mean, guys, a bit of raping did happen back then. I mean, <laughs> this is certainly yeah. in this fucking story. It's what you just said. It's like, how how did we get to the point where people can get everything taken away from them in every other way? But when it's that, it's like a Spock's huge outrage. Yeah, it's well, a, it's like look what happened to Theon. It's like he's getting like like uh, fingers sliced off and like brutally tortured yeah. and stuff, and castrated, and like nobody has a problem with that. <laughs> it's like again, the the moment there's like a a rape scene involved, um, suddenly that's just a line that can't be crossed. It's like yeah. Uh, oh, I'm not talking about some people like yeah, but that wasn't the book. It's like oh, I'm not talking about people saying it was inaccurate. I'm talking about the people who are like you can't have that in in TV. That's yeah. disgusting. That's horrible. Mm -hmm. I mean, which is hilarious the... because, dude, do you remember like growing up back in the day, the freaking Lifetime Network and Hallmark Network was nothing but the ladies with abusive husbands are getting raped network, right? Like <laughs> it was no, no shit. Like 90s after school special television was like 10 times more edgy <laughs> than what we have in theaters now. Yeah. <laughs> this, you know, recently, right? I just, I just got done watching um, Fast and the Furious 10, right? Yeah. And <laughs> it was a bizarre experience because I feel like I've been transported back to the 2000s because it's like suddenly there's this movie that's got like, um, you know, all the fast cars and stuff, but just like beautiful women in bikinis, just shots of them for no fucking reason whatsoever, just because they could do it. 
because they thought that's cool it's probably going to be mostly guys that are watching this movie that's what guys want to look at fuck it put it in and i just thought perfect that's all we want just give the audience what they want stop trying to decide what's right for them you know it's such a rare thing in movies nowadays it's it's almost like whoa i feel like i'm on a, a little time warp back to a different era but look uh, hbo hbo max hbo whatever you want to call it that that network that channel was built on tits yep <laughs> if, if you seriously go back built to the old, old it was it was all of their shows uh it's a comedy but with tits it's a drama. <laughs> I mean, just everything about HBO, it's the network. If you're going to be on an HBO show, you will do nudity. I mean, that's they kind of wow. built it on that, and that's fine. But I didn't begin to really notice the sort of not just desexualization of women, which is not every – I mean, you know, you mentioned Fast X, and thank God for that. I mean, there's – you know, there, it's, there's sexy women in that, in that movie because, you know, that I, that's an important – I think it's an important element part of a film, but – when The Force Awakens came out in 2015, the fact that there was no romance in that film, not one romance, and they shut it down at the end when Ray kind of friend zones Finn. I mean, look, we don't have to talk about that piece of hot garbage, but the fact that you know, romance, I think, is a part of Star Wars. It's it's a part of that that genre, a space opera. It's, there's going to be romance. The fact that there's nothing in, in that film, it was because people people forget that the original Star Wars, I'm talking about when it was called Star Wars, not this episode four, A New Hope bullshit. It was it was about a guy, a kid, a farm boy who saw a video of a girl and basically fell in love with a hologram and wanted to bang that chick and then rescue her and be the hero. I mean, that's that's yeah. how it all his interest in her his romantic interest in that girl is what was part of his motivation. I mean, also yeah. his uh, aunt and uncle died, but, um, <laughs> and he had no home and nowhere, but yeah, he was on a great big quest for gash. You're absolutely correct. That was actually <laughs> yeah. what the whole yeah. plot was. Someone said in the chat, uh, the, the Bush of destiny, which I think is earlier when I was talking about Marion's Bush on the deck of the, of the submarine there but but it, there's there's a conscious effort when you look at someone like karen gillen who is objectively a very sexy and attractive woman and you see nebula as she was portrayed originally to now there is a clear effort effort from corporate disney to desexualize everything uh the agenda or as you put it drinker it's so fun i i watch a lot of other shows and everyone says the message like you say it now. Yeah, it's that's, like, that's my one like, contribution to the human race. <laughs> no, but it's like I'm like, oh wow, did they watch the drinker too? Like, like the message. It's it's but it's clearly Disney has leaned into that. I just how long can they hold out? I mean, without I mean, what they go through seven thousand people laid off recently. Is anyone getting the message that the audience hates this shit? That just get us back to good storytelling get us back to maybe it's now it's become a shock when there's not a mixed race couple in a movie you know what i'm talking about like every yeah. single and we'll talk about the flash later uh it, it's like every movie you see now mixed race couple desexualized woman you'd never see a woman a hot woman in heels i don't know if you saw the new barbie trailer that dropped today the full trailer for barbie but there's even a whole thing about high heels or flats which is interesting that the film is going to deal with those issues. Um, but I, it's, it's well, obviously an agenda that the audience is not, is not down with. Well, it's, it's just, uh, as we talked about earlier, I think you mentioned it, Chris, like um, if your agenda is to say like, well, we need to, uh, we, we need to stop sexualizing women and like not presenting them with these unrealistic uh, body types, you know, like super lean and, and, big tits and everything uh okay fine i can get behind that if that's really what you want to do but then at the same time i can't present yeah well, <laughs> I, I'm not, I don't love it but yeah if you <laughs> stick to your principles though, but then what they do is like you've got these guys um 
Oh, sorry. I think I'm cutting out for a second. Yeah, yeah. yeah you were like you were like Ron DeSantis for a second there. Yeah. Uh -oh. yeah. <laughs> the second uh, you win in full support of great big moves, the internet's trying yeah, to cut you down. Great big tits. <laughs> but no. But then at the same stroke, you've you've got these guys who are like uh, built like bodybuilders and always get their shirts off, like for those big hero shots. You know, mm -hmm. you can't have it both ways. You can't say it's it's unacceptable to sexualize. Well, I mean, women come on, let's. Men. No, no, yeah, like, are we reading anything into the fact that, uh, you know, freaking the big bad, apparent big bad from The Force Awakens takes the shirt off and has bigger tits than the main female star? You know what I mean? Like, she, her bra actually fits better backwards. You know what I mean? Like, that's... Oh, no. <laughs> Jesus. Uh, there is uh, yeah, one type like... with uh, a particular body type which they will show off, um, which is... I remember in Star Trek Discovery, there was a, one of the cast members with an unignorably fat ass, and they put her in very slim clothing to accentuate those curves. And I still have nightmares from that. Oh, is that the big fat ginger one? Yeah, that's the one. Oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, Tilly, that's the one. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, I just think, like, how do you pass your fucking physical for, for being on a yeah. starship? Or is there one? <laughs> I guess there's not. Um but yeah, it's it's just uh, it's that interest in double standard, I suppose. And does so, it take extra power from the transporter for someone of of that size? Well, it's more mass to move, isn't it? So you've yeah. got to. It probably takes more processing power, I think, to move her from one part of the, the universe to another, because there's yeah. a lot more of her. But yeah, you think you could go into it and be like, hey, can you can you shave off like twenty pounds while I'm in here, <laughs> while I've been atomized? Just take some of those atoms and throw them away. Be all right. I just imagine her on the on the platform fading and then coming back in again and them having to boost the power to. to... <laughs> I'm giving her all she's got, Captain. There's just too much of her, Captain. <laughs> <laughs> no, I was I, I was nice. It was nice to see Lizzo pop up the Mandalorian, though. It's nice to see the Death Star get recast, but uh, no. <laughs> yeah. Uh, well, I think we talked as well about this on. Um, last week's open bar where dove soap had produced this fantastic advert for um for women in gaming and <laughs> it, it, you know you start off with this like you know kick-ass action girl you know she's slim and everything and then she takes all her armor off and then she's just a big blob and you know you're that's supposed to be like empowering somehow it's like somehow you know, girls yeah. girls want to see themselves represented on screen it's like i don't think you understand the psychology of people who play video games they, they don't want to see themselves with all their flaws and their shortcomings and all their, their weaknesses and stuff represented on screen. They want to see themselves as an ass-kicking, awesome, powerful adventurer or whatever. Hey, listen, okay, if someone wants to play as the blob, <laughs> I guess it's nice to have the options of RPGs, but... I don't know what the hell that ad was supposed to try and say. We went over this last time. It's like, there's so many yeah. confusing messages you could pull from it. It's like... Remember the, the the thing everyone would say before is like, ah, oh, it's so silly in those like medieval games where women have barely any armor to show off all of this. Like that's not very protective. But in that ad, she takes off the armor, and it's like, ah, oh, better. And it's like, what? I don't know what right. the fuck's going on anymore. Yeah, like, it's so it, it, that has always been a mixed messaging thing that few people catch. It's like the, the same people who are like, oh, women are wearing so little armor are simultaneously like, what? What's with the cleavage chest plate, right? Like, what's with the mm. what's with the boob armor? They actually want them to wear less, right? The net result <laughs> is they wind up wearing even fucking less. It always blows my mind. It's and been then, happening for years. And we're all sitting here like, fine, you can be naked, I guess. Jeez, drat. Oh. Yeah, could work yeah. if you're a fat if you're a fat Jedi. If someone tries to stab you with a lightsaber, just going to cauterize on the singeing blubber and. <laughs> 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 So that well, it's just like I've it's like you stabbed the person like all the way up to the hilt of the lightsaber and it's like still not reached their vital organs. Like, god damn right? it. <laughs> it's like Obi-Wan with the lightsaber at the beginning of uh, episode one, just sitting there at the yeah. door. This is Turn not working. <laughs> Shit. Just, just stuck there like a popsicle in a stick. Right. <laughs> oh. Um, but yeah, well, it looks like going circling back to indiana jones just to close this bit off um oh God. they've got like a month or so before the movie comes out um uh, already <coughs> the word of mouth is terrible we've seen the critics reviews um uh, the entire atmosphere around this movie just seems poisonous like nobody wants it and 
by all accounts, it costs like $300 million to make. And that's not even including marketing. That's just the production budget. Because they reshot the fucking thing about three times to make this. Um, yeah. Because they panicked. You know, mm. and so that and the, the star injured himself yet again. Like I only watch Harrison Ford films to find out what body party is going to break on set anymore. Like, How many yeah. ankles does he have left? <laughs> I know yeah, he's did, like did a black door. knight for Monty Python. <laughs> yeah, tis but a flesh wound. <laughs> right. yeah, did the door from Millennium Falcon like fall on his foot or something? Like the most <laughs> random accident ever. Well, yeah. but yeah. So the, the the result is like when you've got a three hundred million dollar budget, you've probably got another. 150 200 million dollars in market and you're getting close to a billion dollars just to break even and mm. it ain't gonna get to a billion dollars i don't think not with the word of mouth that it's got and so it's just another failure for lucasfilm i guess like to add to the the growing list i'm it's, gonna make a uh, prediction and say that on the audience score it might actually be quite high in like a 70 80 kind of thing just because people they weren't thrilled by it, but in a kind of B minus ish B kind of way, that oh, it was a fine film. I, it was okay. So I think it might get that score in the end in the audience side. That's my. I, I think in internet circles, though, like so many people are going to flock to this thing to or flock to Rotten Tomatoes to downvote it, because Maybe. the the online conversation around it is awful. Like nobody yeah. wants it. Could it could it wind up being bad enough that you would go see it just because of the badness? Do you think it'll <laughs> land on that note? There's got to be some people who would be curious to see what this is, but it's unreal to me because nobody wanted this 20 years ago. Like, it's, right? Like, it's like, how the fuck did this get made? Because at least with TFA, you could argue, like, yeah, the Star Wars fandom was, like, ready for more. That, uh, you know, fucking monkey's paw sort of shit there. I, I just, yeah. I, it's amazing <laughs> that Indiana Jones 5, question mark, like... Fuck, I don't even know how to explain that to my dad. I don't think he believes right? it's coming out. <laughs> like, what do you mean? Indiana Jones and the sensibly priced condo of Boca Raton. That's the full title. Yeah. Of <laughs> I asked him if he'd seen a trailer, and he said, uh, is Harrison Ford in it? And I was like, yeah, he's still alive. <laughs> as much as it is. Is he just... Is he... Like, is he just, as an old man, is he nostalgic and he just wants to do, like, a little farewell tour of all of his most famous roles? You know, he's done Han Solo, <laughs> he's done Rick Deckard, you know, now it's yeah. time to say goodbye to Indy. Is that just <laughs> shit all over my favorite characters. Yeah. They're, kind they're of, yeah. Because, like, apparently, yeah, because he was choking back tears at Cannes when he was when he was you know presenting the movie. And I just thought, is he crying because he knows how shit it is and he's, like, destroyed his legacy? No, this? it's just the Valium. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> and it's weird because for a good 20 years whenever we do talk shows or things like that it always came across as the most grumpy disaffected didn't really want to talk about it but it turned out in the end he would turn into be a kind of a big softy and 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 you know kind of nostalgic about his roles who knew i mean i i guess like i suppose when you get to that age you're you're very yeah. much aware that like time is kind of running out and maybe you do get just more emotional about stuff like that you know it, it's yeah. probably probably a tough thing to say like yeah this thing that was a major part of my life for like 30 40 years this is the last time i'm going to be doing it it's mm. gonna that's gonna get to you i suppose uh, just i don't a, know the the thing everyone's <laughs> pointing out like he made them all shitty dads Yep. Yes, absolutely. Every single time they bring him back as the deadbeat dad or whatever. I honestly think, look, my he, he can squeeze out a few crocodile tears at a con. I still think he pretty much does these big kind of franchise movies to fund the other stuff that he actually wants to do. Right. He winds up doing these little you hear about these little these smaller movies. I can't think of like a title at, at the moment, but you'll hear about it like, oh, Harrison Ford's in this random like kind of just emotional sort of drama film over here and it's like, yeah, like it's that one race in the like... wilderness with the dog and it's like, yeah, yeah <laughs> right no way like, like an actual guy who's walking around with him or whatever that looks right and it's like that's the kind of crap he actually wants to make so he does these basically to pay his light bill plus he's crashed a lot of planes gang that, that <laughs> yeah, costs those lawsuits, money those lawsuits start to mount up i suppose <laughs> you've destroyed a plane and our golf course by landing on it <laughs> <laughs> I quite, uh, that Yellowstone show was uh, that was quite nice. I enjoyed it. It had a good spirit and vibe to it, uh, set in a cool place. Uh, but whenever they had to have a moving, like at a brisk pace or walking, uh, you just had that Joe Biden kind of thing going on. 
So uh, yeah, 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 the perp uh, walk. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Dave L's made a good point here. Dead, deadbeat bads is what all the women writers have experience with. They all have daddy issues and want to put them on screen instead of talking to a therapist. I, I think so many shows and, and movies now are just like the writer's own personal therapy session. You know, just like dealing mm-hmm. with all their problems. Like, if you're going to tell me that something like She Hulk or Velma was anything other than just like a bunch of middle aged women projecting all of their hang ups and insecurities onto the screen, like, yeah, you're going to have to go some. Uh, yeah <laughs> you just killed it so <laughs> yeah um <laughs> uh, yeah just before we go on I, I was gonna read out a couple of super chats just on this um robo 96 gave us a hundred british pounds the best kind of pounds i'll say that um mm. it says indy 5 looks to do for the crystal skull what the star wars sequel trilogy did for the prequels i.e put them in a more favorable light and make you appreciate that they were at least made with a sense of fun and goodwill rather than the corporate counterfeit products that followed them i think and and buy some of the original creators you know what i mean that too will give it a little more cachet the thanos meme in the perhaps i treated you too harshly Mm -hmm. yeah very much so the Uh, more time that goes the more time that goes on the more i come to appreciate the prequels not in the execution of it but in the bare bones of its arc of its story and its politics and everything was great just the execution was so cool yeah it was as, kind as, of bad execution i also think bad timing at the mm-hmm. time because when you really track the arc of the story that they were telling it was like okay the original star wars trilogy was sort of this great big sort of explosive happy happy joy joy right it, at the mm-hmm. tail end of the 70s when there was a lot of dark films in the theaters and uh, it was very much kind of a celebration of cinema and, and the good guys won the day and the bad guys lost. That was very much. And and all three, even though the second movie was more downbeat, you know, they, they still kind of followed that tone. The prequels were basically a tragedy. They were going to start mm-hmm. out as good as it was going to get and get worse. And then mm-hmm. by the third one, it was going to be the darkest one of all three. And it was right. So it was like it, and it and. They released them right at a time when 9-11 was about to happen. <laughs> so I was like, let's release it. You know what's a good time to release a tragedy? <laughs> right after these planes slammed into buildings. I think we'll make that happen. I think that was actually an element of it, actually. It was just kind of bad timing in general with the public. Yep. Um, next one is from Got2319 uh, says, Hail Drinker, I was in Disney World last week and I can confirm that Disney is completely ignoring the existence of their LA uh, remakes. Nothing beyond obligatory posters, no merch or anything. It's very telling, yet they keep making these movies anyway. Um, yeah, sounds about right, to be honest. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, and we also had one from... Just one second. Just have to scroll up here. Uh, Masco, Mas Jackal says, uh, Hey Drinker, I just watched Sisu after you recommended it. Clearly shows uh, to Marvel that you don't need hundreds of millions of dollars to make a good movie. I'll suggest, again, a Drinker's extra shots of No Country for Old Men. Such a great film. Believe that! I do believe that. It is a good film. I really liked it. And I'm glad you enjoyed Sisu, so nice one. Uh, and 247 Arbox says, Question for the panel. What are the top three films or shows that each of you would recommend an aspiring writer to learn from? I'm particularly looking for help with plot and villains as a fantasy novelist, but more general recommendations are fine too. Mm. So I guess just any any good <clears throat> recommendations for us from us. Uh, for Ooh. writing, Deadwood. Yep. Breaking bad for me. I mean, like Walter White as a as a hero going to a, an antagonist is a Pretty interesting thing to explore. I yeah, do I, it really well. I would rate Breaking Bad is going to be a really great template for just understanding how to do an arc, I suppose, like in the most simplistic format of just he goes from this to this and just pay attention to how they do it in each. Even like, um, something was really cool about Breaking Bad was like there would be a science lesson. I think it's, I can't remember how long they kept this going, but a science lesson that would relate to, um, what's happening in the episode, right? Like he was teaching a student something and he'd be like, if you think of the subtext, how it applies to human characters, like, ooh. So, yeah, that will be that will be a good. Um, so, I mean, I really fucking love the Prestige as a movie. I would probably not recommend that until you're uh, 
more familiar with a lot more conventions because that one breaks up structure pretty heavily. Uh, I guess Nolan does that a couple of times, right? Like Memento or um, a couple of films. I was trying to think of like maybe the best film to introduce you to non-linear storytelling um, and how best to achieve that. That would be tough. I don't know what film I would fully recommend it on, though, because it's a tough thing to nail. You don't uh, catch many filmmakers doing it very often. Yeah. Memento is a good, I guess, a good example. It's crazy that that film exists. It's, it's absolutely not. It's a film that you watch backwards. Or, uh, I guess that's how you <laughs> sell it to someone. Yeah. Uh, anything else from any, the rest of the panel? Any other yeah, good recommendations? Uh, uh, I, I would seek out Christopher Nolan's first feature following. He played the Slamdance Film Festival. It's black and white. So that was before he did Memento. And then a film that I consider a modern classic uh, by Robert Altman, The Player, which I think is just a brilliant, you know, the protagonist is also uh, a huge Hollywood asshole. Um, it's also a really interesting commentary on Hollywood in that, in sort of the early 90s. Uh, I, I just, I love that film. And uh, I don't know, I, I think Robert Altman is brilliant. It's just, it's so well done. So yeah, yeah. The Player look find that movie there should there should be a modern remake of the player because they talk about all these erotic <clears throat> movies in in that not, talk about marvel movies I'm trying to think is would like a framed narrative be like non-linear storytelling because if so there's a whole bunch of film noir that fits that where you have yeah. sort of the hard-boiled dick or the entrapped character like an out of the past with robert mitchum where he's you sort of are meeting him halfway through the story and then he talks you through how you got to this point and then the story continues yeah, uh, yeah. there's a lot of movies that fit that bill or like and, uh, uh in that genre doa which is great a, a guy yeah. poisoned he's got 24 hours to solve his own murder i mean yeah. what a great those old film noirs are just so <laughs> and so hey you got you got crank for the modern version of that right yeah yeah oh yeah, <laughs> yeah. that's right Oh, that plot has been ripped off a lot of times. The, I'm I'm poisoned and I've got to solve my own murder a lot of times. Yeah. yeah. Craig I would think, it in uh, quite an interesting way, I'll see. Uh, <laughs> just The Empire Strikes Back, just if you want to study how you can have uh, different storylines that intersect and eventually converge, I think that's a good, uh, it's just a good 101 for, for story writing. Yeah. Yeah. Um, would I guess would I rank Unforgiven amongst these as well? Like oh yeah, as I'd a, say that's a top tier one on one for deconstruction. Yeah, like to deconstruct a character, a character like that, but then rebuild him as something like almost more terrifying than what he was made out to be, um, and and play on the the idea of mythology and stuff. Like yeah, there, there's a lot of fun you can have with that movie uh, in terms of character piece and stuff. If you were to ask Ryan Johnson fundamentally, he'd probably be like, yeah, that would kind of like my movie TLJ. Like unforgiving. Yeah. Be like, nice one, Ryan. Yeah, hang in there. <laughs> <laughs> do you know the uh, Do you know the director of uh, Quantum Mania said the opening shot is supposed to evoke Unforgiven? Oh, Jesus! What? Oh fuck! Oh, <laughs> it's it's dang. like how dare you have that film's <laughs> name in your fucking map? <laughs> I mean, it, to to be fair, right? Vin Diesel when he was talking about the Fast and the Furious movies said like, well, it has to end at some point. Like, um, you know, J.R.R. Tolkien knew when to end his stories, <laughs> and so do we. <laughs> and I just thought, God bless you, Vin, that you <laughs> you, you put these films in the same category as Lord of the Rings. Now I'm just picturing J.R. Tolkien being like, them Fast and Furious movies, man. It's my jam. <laughs> right? <laughs> it's like, what's my theme of uh, Lord of the Rings? Family. <laughs> uh, well, it's not just been Indiana Jones that's been failing recently at, uh, at, <laughs> at the critics and the box office and stuff. Well, that'll come later, but... The Little Mermaid is right on the horizon, and uh, in some areas you can actually go see it already. And the, the reviews have started to come in, and they're not great. Uh, mm. Imagine our shock on this one. Uh, <laughs> like, uh, there's one here from The Independent that I think is quite interesting. I'll just read a little bit of it, just to give you a flavor of it. So, way back in 1989, The Little Mermaid delivered the kiss of life to Disney's floundering animation studio, ushering in a period now fondly thought of as its creative renaissance. 
Now its live action remake is arriving at a time of falling profits and uncertainty about the studio's future. Talk about synchronicity. But the differences between The Little Mermaid of yesterday and the one that we've got today, as with many of these remakes, are really the differences between what the industry was and what it is now. This is A Little Mermaid robbed of its voice, its choices ruled largely by fear rather than the thrill of creative risk. Uh, and... Um, what's this one? Oh, God, yeah. So... We've spent the past three decades bullying poor Ariel for risking it all for a guy whose only green flags are that he likes dogs and she sh sea shanties. But Bailey offers up the best defense possible. There's such a luminous quality to her desires and an intensity to her desperation that she digs down deeper into Ariel than anyone before. Her version of Ariel voice, uh, sorry, Ariel's um, original voice actor said, part of your world features a spectacular keychains. It will soon be butchered by at every karaoke joint in the land. But there's a real stink of obligation to everything that exists around Bailey and her star-making turn. There's two pretty but inconsequential new ballads and a rap performed by Aquafina's Scuttle that is somehow um, a real rap and not. And I just thought that just... Ugh. Oh, that makes me that what, sounds, what yeah that sounds a special kind of terrible <laughs> because i i've heard this little rap sequence from aquafina and it just made me want to kill myself <laughs> like, <laughs> like someone, as someone who's just out of the loop on like pop music of all kinds sometimes you just you, you dip the toe in you know and you're like man I'm never listening to any of this ever again. <laughs> I'm going to hide yeah. in the deep, dark subgenres of metal at this point. <laughs> like, and I never want to come out. I mean, I had, I had that feeling when uh, Ozzy Osbourne hooked up with Post Malone a while back. <laughs> I, like, uh, I, don't, I don't think I'll be heading down this alley anytime soon. I mean, who had the idea of making Aquafina a voice actor? Like, play to your strengths, <laughs> you know? It's like when you've got someone who sounds like a 70 year old that's been smoking her entire life and she's only like 25, <laughs> like, oh, you don't want to be hearing that. Like, that's not your strength. Well, everyone remembers back in 1989 where they had Run DMC do a rap song and the original right. Little Mermaid. So, come on, let's just keep it going. Yeah, I still remember Public Enemy's Rousing Lion King number. My goodness. <laughs> <laughs> oh, God damn it. But yeah, there's a few other reviews here that, uh, yeah. From the Financial Times, frankly, this Ariel could do better. Uh, the Austin Chronicle says this remake just sort of treads water, buoyed up by the excellence of the original. Uh, Ugh, already with the puns, yuck. Yeah. Mm. Uh, yeah, so it's sitting at the moment, uh, it's a kind of middle of the road 72% with the, with the critics, so it's kind of not bad. Um, I would expect that to change quite a bit once it hits all the major territories uh keep, but, keep in yeah. mind family movies there's there's usual usually kind of they handle them with kid gloves a little bit initially you know what mm. i mean because it, it doesn't quite have the same bar of quality to hurdle as like a serious drama or something i i'm pretty sure that no critic is going to criticize the the main actress no That's gonna happen no they, they absolutely not so even the most scathing of reviews will be like, this movie fucking sucks. But, you know, Halle Bailey is fantastic. Well Stunning done. and brave. Maybe yeah. she is drinker. Hmm? Maybe she is, yeah. I will she, no, she's, Dude, she's a chameleon, which explains the eyes anyway. But um, no, she's, she's incredible. <laughs> it's a joke. My goodness. <laughs> it's going to be heard. just like in... Uh, sorry, it's just going to be like in Aladdin. It'll be the same thing, the real life uh, remake, where they gave the princess her own special new ballad to empower her, and it sucked. And it's going to be right. the same thing with this, where they give her a couple new songs, and they will suck as well. Well, they they've talked quite a bit as well about her motivation and and uh, you know what this movie's all about from her point of view, because the original is that she was willing to give up her voice so that she could live in the world above because you'd fallen in love with a man there and that cannot be that cannot be done now as a motivation for your female character because she has to be strong and empowered and doesn't need no man you know like <laughs> they're just there yeah, we don't need them anymore uh, and so it's all about her and just like wanting to explore the world herself and apparently she's the one who saves the day 
Um, you might remember from the original, since we were kids back in the 90s, uh, it's Prince Eric who saves the day, kills Ursula when she's about to murder Ariel. But uh, no, that doesn't happen now. Ariel saves Ooh. herself. Because of course she does. I guess he's just kind of there on the sidelines, cheering her on. Right. Um, what do you want to bet he's unconscious? Well, I just think like, what's the? How does the romance work in a film like this? Because it was kind of the the core message of the original movie that uh, you know that love for another person it can, you know, it can prompt you to make sacrifices. It can push you out of your comfort zone. It can make you, uh, you know take steps into a whole different world. Uh, now it's just like, yeah, you don't need anyone, but uh, you might choose to hook up with someone, I guess, if they're worthy of your time. Um, that that seems to be where they're going with it now. And yeah. man, it just it doesn't seem very inspiring, you know? How does I... it work phys physiognomy terms? Like if, if they're going to hook up? Like how do you have sex with a mermaid? Right. Yeah. I well, think he's the, asking the mechanic, the biomechanics of fucking a fish, I think is where we're going. The here. lighthouse. Right. If you ever watch the lighthouse, oh, there's a bit no. there where he fucks a mermaid and uh, explains it quite well. Have you ever <laughs> watched The Shape of Water? <laughs> so I, I want to bring this to the panel because this is something I've thought about a few times because my mind is twisted like this. But you know, the centaur in fantasy things where it's got the body of a horse and then like Don't the top go of, there. of a person. Don't go there. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, is it hung like a horse? Yeah, so if the lady, you know, what if the centaur is really sophisticated and intelligent and is a real gentleman? So can uh, like a woman hook up with a centaur? What would it, would it be classed as bestiality? I don't know. Like, would it be technically illegal? Hmm. I guess I'm it depends sure. on your fantasy world. I mean, you know, I like the idea of a sophisticated centaur. Like he's in, he's wearing like a tuxedo or something, like a custom made mm. one. Like if centaurs know. were real, they would get rights equal to humans, I think. And so, yes. yeah, that's, that's what would happen. There, there would so definitely what... be advocate groups for them. I would say. <laughs> What are they, they going to do with Ursula? There subreddits for them. Are you shitting me? Yeah. Come on. <laughs> There's probably erotic fiction on Tumblr. <laughs> right now. Right now. Uh, so what are they going to do with the character of Ursula? Because she's an evil character, and usually the go-to is that she's uh, essentially lesbian, is usually like the subtext. But now they need to empower her somehow, and she has to have her own narrative arc. So what are they going to do with her? Uh, well, she's they, a Karen. Been... Probably she's a Karen. I mean, she's played right. by Melissa McCarthy, so that's yeah. like enough of a disability yeah. as it is. Yeah, that's true. Uh, <laughs> they're gonna go funny evil. That's that's mm. that's the direction they're gonna go. Okay. <laughs> she was probably wronged by a man at some point, oh, and this is all like yeah, well-deserved yeah. revenge against. Oh the world, man, so. uh, you probably have no idea how close to the target you hit there. That's that's the <laughs> horrible part. I am well, certain that's probably it. The thing is, I know the rules. I know the rules of all this stuff, like how they write movies, and like I know what they have to operate under. And so, like, I just I apply the formula to whatever scenario they have to come up with, and I'm like, yeah, it's inevitably going to be a man's fault somehow down the line, and mm -hmm. that's, yeah. that's the motivation for everything. Uh, and Triton's X. That's how. Yeah. It works. Once you understand the rule set that these writers at Disney have to work under, it's like you could pretty much predict the story for any movie that they produce. You could pretty much just get an AI to write it at this point. Yeah. It's like as long as you establish a set of rules, like, uh, you know, uh, woman must never be at fault. Man is like root cause of all problems. Like you can just like put all those criteria into an AI and get it to produce a script for you and you'll yeah. have a Disney movie. Guaranteed. And whenever possible, the main villain has to be ultimately revealed to be a rich, evil white guy. Like, that's yeah. also a big thing. Yeah. I mean, if Cruella de Vil can, uh, can be transmuted into being a misunderstood character, you know, then right. I guess Ursula also has to be misunderstood in some way. Oh, are they gonna? You think they'll go, yes, slay queen with her? Like, kind of little. I could see that happening. I think, I think you mm. might be right on that. She'll she'll uh, she'll have some grudge against Prince Eric, and Ariel has to save him. And mm -hmm. the 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 take will be like, well, I know he's evil and like he's wronged you in some way, but you know, have mercy on him, mm -hmm. please. Um, yeah, 
It's just, but like talking, you know, thinking about like how this might do in terms of box office, because ultimately, like what the critics say is kind of irrelevant. It's all going to come down to the audience reception of it. Um, it kind of feels like out of all the live action remakes that Disney have decided to do in recent years, this feels like the one that's gotten the most pushback. You know, partly because of the casting and stuff, and just partly because I think people might be over it a little bit. Like, I think, be, I think they could this. I think the casting is is going to be irrelevant. I mean, and everything I've heard is she's not the problem with the movie. I, I mean, the the big problem with this movie because I think it'll do a okay opening weekend and then it will tank. It's going to absolutely spiral and tank. And the reason is running time. It's two hours and fifteen minutes. This is a movie mainly targeting children. And uh, my colleague Alan Ng at Film Threat, who saw it, says that at the about the ninety minute mark. Kids were squirming and getting restless and bored. They were bored. This is too. Uh, look, someone please make a T-shirt that says "Normalize two-hour movies." There <laughs> Thank is. You. Yeah. you. I'm so sick of these movies that are north of two hours. If your movie is going to be north of two hours, you better have a good reason for it. It better be a an epic, right? Just give me a David Lean epic, something. But but there's no reason these these movies slide over two hours because there's no strong creative figure because there's so many boxes that need to be checked by Hollywood because it's all about a director having to compromise bullshit for like the marketing department or this executive or this girlfriend of an executive producer who happens to be in a scene that they now can't cut. I mean, this is these are these are the dumb politics that filmmakers now have to thread the needle. And, and so yeah. so. I mean, look, Lucas and Spielberg, they had the right formula. Their movies were two hours, maybe two hours and two minutes with credits, but they were a tight two hours. Go back, you know, all the classic films that they made during the era when Spielberg and Lucas were at their height, right? They're all two hour movies. You start these movies sliding over two hours and you're looking at 20 minutes of trailers. That's a three hour experience at the theater. I'm not, I'm not signing up for that. Sisu, by contrast, made for 6 million euros is 93 minutes. It's a tight 93. You're in, yep. you're out, entertained as hell. Great film. Yeah. So, so these north of two hour movies, especially a north of two hour film targeting children yeah. and also the, the um, uh, kids from the 90s who saw these films when they were, you know, when they were young and have those imprinted memories. Uh, or wait, wasn't Little Mermaid 89? Somewhere around there. Anyways, um, yeah. these things were all in clamshell VHS tapes. I'm sure your audience remembers those drinker. Oh, yeah. The running time is going to kill this movie. It's stupid, weak, and lazy of the studios not to enforce more strict guidelines for, for running time on these films. I know the theater owners hate it. I mean, why is Indiana Jones 225? I mean, you know, The Flash is 225. Uh, oh, my God. Know, all, well, all these- are you ready for three hours of Oppenheimer? Oh my yeah, God! And that I don't that, could be, that could be kind of interesting. But yeah. yeah, Christopher Nolan movies are a little bit of a rule unto themselves. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> like, I'll, I'll take three hours of Christopher Nolan's Oppenheimer over two twenty of The Little oh. Mermaid. This movie doesn't need to be that long. Oh yeah, and then it does this stupid thing where I mean, this is I pro- I don't know maybe I don't know if I've I may have seen more of the live action Disney films than uh, others on this stream. I think they're all awful. They're terrible. Yeah. Pinocchio is probably the worst one. Oh, but yeah. the thing that I noticed about Beauty and the Beast, which is also awful, I, I can't think of a good one, um, is the sort of like the and look, I, I, I don't mind diversity in movies. I think it's fine when it's organic. But when it is like when you looked at Beauty and the Beast, which is it's supposed to be set in France, right? Like it just seems so diverse that they were just pushing it. It just takes me out of it. It just doesn't seem you know the reality you know it's right it's like victorian or medieval france too like it's like what um it doesn't doesn't make any sense it doesn't make any sense (laughs) apparently um the i I don't know the prince his mom is black but he's white but it's like (laughs) it's but it's all like it's just like they're just casting for diversity for diversity's sake you know Uh, and it just it it, it, it sort of takes the idea of a classic fairy tale and just makes it stupid to me. I mean, I'd, I'd rather see, and I'm sure no one on the stream can even name an African fable. Why not make an African fable? Isn't there an African fable about a mermaid anyways? 
that they could have made that or made this about Ariel's sister. There actually is a Black Mermaid. I mean, you know, I just think that those stories are more interesting because we already know what happens in this movie based on the animation. And, and you're only going to be reminded that that's a better film. And it's what, yeah. like 87 minutes or 83 minutes? It's tight. The, the running time is going to kill this because the running time is going to kill this movie. Chris, have you never I, I heard of the gripe. African fable of Cleopatra? Yeah. <laughs> that went down well. I mean, I think audiences are, are just tired of this. I think it's gotten to the point now where audiences, mainstream audience, are just like, this is stupid. Stop doing this. Either tell a new story. I mean, that Peter Pan and Wendy thing was just hot garbage. Oof. Well, yeah. yeah, look at that as an example because the original animated movie was about half the length of that. Oh my it accomplished God, probably dude. twice as much. I have this gripe about most modern movies, though. Like, we were talking yeah. about, like, film noir, which are now considered, like, serious films. They were B-movies back in the day. They were, like, mm -hmm. an hour 30. Like, mm -hmm. I just looked up out of the past. It's, like, 92 minutes or something like that. Like, <laughs> and this is considered, like, a hallmark of, of classic film or whatever. I feel like we, you could cut a ton out of a lot of modern movies and mm -hmm. they would oh, yeah. not be worse. Um, it's it, especially for a kid's movie, though. I mean, that's just an unforgivable affront. Yeah. Kids are not um, going to sit through a two hour, two and a half hour movie. No fucking way. No, it's the it's the double redundancy that it's too long and bloated. But they're also criticized like Ant-Man and the Wasp or Indiana Jones for having meandering plots with no center, just going from set yep. piece to set piece. So there's no rationale. And the second thing is just from a commercial point of view, if you scrunch it down to two hours, then you can have maybe that extra screening during the day to get in more crowds to come along rather than just restrict it to maybe three screenings a day if it's two and a half yep. hours long. So it, I just don't understand it. It's so weird. There was a lot of when I was looking up articles because I just did a video on the history of Disney and, and like Walt Disney and his legacy and whatnot. Um, and while I was doing research for that, I looked up stuff on The Little Mermaid and a lot of the Hollywood publications were like, is this going to underperform Ant-Man 3? <laughs> so, <laughs> I, which when I saw that, I was like, oh, this is really not going to go well. OK, I got gotcha. you. <laughs> right. So I'm wondering if that's not going to be more so the neighborhood of what it actually winds up doing. I, I can I see that for sure. Talking about yeah. them run times, by the way, I still feel like this, the remakes and everything, it all comes back to the fucking 2019 Lion King thing that ruined everything. It's like original 90 minutes remake, Ooh. two hours. It's like, how did you add half an hour? How did you do that? <laughs> yeah. It's like, I thought it was a shot for shot remake. You just copied the film. It's like you somehow added 30 fucking minutes. How'd you do yeah. that? Is it. I don't know. Is it like directors having too much control? Is it like a bit of narcissism on their part? Or is it just. I don't know, like not having the ability to tell a concise, like well structured story. And so no, they just I, kind of meander from it's thing to meeting thing. after meeting. It's corporate, it, it's it's corporatism. Corporatism is killing entertainment. I mean, corp, cor, corporate structure kills art, everything, anything corporate. It's it's guys like Nolan who try to avoid it or are better at the politics of it. James Gunn also he, happens good at that as well i mean it, you know chris nolan doesn't even have an office on the lot he works out of his garage in his backyard so he can like spend more time with his kids so uh you know yeah. like it uh, just was it you who, 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 so, sorry to interrupt it was, was it you sure, who no, I, no. I thought i watched a video where you were talking about how one of the factors in the increasing length i could be wrong but i thought it was you um who said one of the factors in the increasing length of hollywood films might actually be because um of the increasing production quality and whatnot of the hbo dramas because then people kind of realize that they could get the movie length experience sort of decompressed in a longer form over 10 or 13 episodes or whatever but i'm not sure if that was you but regardless that's um, i've seen that argument before where it's yeah this, it's sort of that might be a factor in why movies are getting longer is because they're trying to pack more and more they're trying to imitate in a weird way the HBO format where you had right. they're part, trying to pack 10 hours of content basically into two. Uh, believe it or not, this, this is their idea of compressed. I don't think that was me, but uh, there is another theory that says that uh, the reason a lot of these movies are getting longer is because once they get to streaming, it's all about watched minutes 
and watched minutes Ooh. translates into Ooh. success. Watched minutes translates into stock price, etc. So that's interesting. Uh, but, but audiences hate it. I mean, I can tell you, I hate it. I'm sick of it. If you're going to have a, a running time north of two hours, justify it. I mean, it used to be that a good documentary was 90 minutes. A good comedy was 90 minutes. And um, I knew we were talking earlier about uh, tits. And on a serious note, um, it's it, it's uh, we, we can sit here. We, we can talk about the death of certain genres because of this sort of, I, 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 I don't know, this sort of creeping... Uh, this I, look, I don't mind objectifying men. Let's just make it equal. Objectify men and women. You know, let's not take away objectifying or having sexy women in a movie. Put sexy men and women. Fine, who cares? But but the teen sex comedy that is a dead genre <laughs> that will <laughs> never yeah. return. Will they ever? I mean, look, as an IP, could you bring back Porky's? Someone should make an announcement that they're. But I'm gonna gathering from you saying Porky's. good tips. No. In 19 minutes. Yeah, with a, with a name like Porky's, I can only imagine. <laughs> no, <laughs> basically, yeah, we just want ninety minutes of tits. Like, right. <laughs> like yeah, but they would be, it, 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 dude, in twenty twenty three, they would be man tits. You understand this, right? <laughs> oh, oh no, yeah, you're yeah. right. In twenty twenty three, in twenty twenty three, weird science would be two diverse young female uh, roommates who bring to life a uh, Chris Hemsworth. Uh, himbo oh. guy uh, in their experiment. That's what it would be. He'd be, he'd be the character from his Ghostbusters shit, wouldn't he? We'd yeah, like, exactly. Yeah, the dumb as fuck, yeah. But then I they'd say, find towards say, the end that uh, they actually just needed to discover the inner beauty within themselves and they didn't need that, that to conjure up that man in order to feel their self esteem. Well, I think at the end they would les up and just like you yeah, know, like get together because like that's, that's the ultimate sense of empowerment. Uh, I, I say make tits great again. That's what, well, I, that's what I like the idea that someone would be like, why do you guys just go watch porn then? It's like porn has shit plots and not very good action scenes, okay? So <laughs> we gotta bring it all back. I mean, you know, I, I would still I would stack some porn movies up plot wise against most of what Marvel's put out in <laughs> yeah. recent years. And and some have better music. So what the fuck? Yep. <laughs> Definitely better performers. Like the the actors look better in their costumes than those uh... actors care, drinker. That's why yeah, they, 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 care. they care about the source material. Damn it! Mm. <laughs> it, it starts got... starts with a guy who's come to fix the plumbing, but then it subverts your expectations. Ah, yeah. you see, it really you get that double twist when the pizza boy shows up. Mm. <laughs> well, the the other thing I was going to ask about because. Uh, Chris, you have now seen it. You have experienced the Flash. Uh, oh my God, can yeah. you tell us a little bit about it? Is it is it the ultimate DC comic book movie that's going to make us all happy and reinvigorate our faith in comic book films, uh, or is it just a big old piece of overpriced trash? Uh, well, I'm in two minds about it. So there's a couple things about the film. Um, I think you know the basics of the plot from watching the trailer. What you don't know is the first hour of the movie is spent with two Ezra Millers effectively. So Ezra Miller, I think as portrayed, you know, as his sort of take on the flash is he's the comic relief. He's the side character. When it comes to the justice league, you've got sort of mega Chad, you know, Henry Cavill, Superman, Ben Affleck, Batman, manly Jason Momoa as Aquaman. And then you've got sort of on the spectrum, mildly autistic Gen Z Ezra Miller. And in that, in that group dynamic that works because he's not getting the bulk of the screen time, right? He's, he's a side character. He's the comic relief. Okay. He's the lead in this movie. And I can report to you, Ezra Miller can't carry the film. He just cannot. Uh, and and much less you've got so one Ezra Miller, the sort of main Flash, which is like 25 years old in the Snyderverse universe, right, um, ends up finding out that he can slightly turn back time, ends up saving his mother, but then ends up in a universe where he bumps into an 18-year-old version of him pre-Powers, who's just started college. And the two of them have to solve an issue, which I'll get to. He's so annoying. So you've got one who's annoying, and that's the original Flash. Then you've got the new Barry. So, and he's 
incredibly annoying and naive. And he's like the younger brother who's stupider and impulsive and uh, makes poor decisions. Uh, and it's, it's just that first hour is a slog. Once what happens is in this world, this earth, Zod, you know, Zod comes, comes to that world looking, uh, looking for, uh, you know, he, he's on effectively the same mission he was on before he's going to, he's going right? to, yeah, he's going to terraform earth and kill everybody. So right. what does Barry have to do? Barry has to, you know, assemble the justice league. And the first person he goes to visit is Bruce Wayne. And that scene takes place at Wayne Manor and in, in the kitchen. And I will, I got to give the director credit. The kitchen is an exact reproduction of the kitchen from the 1989 Batman where Kim Basinger is Vicki Vale and, and Bruce Wayne. They kind of just sort of hang out in the kitchen with Alfred. Mm -hmm. So they recreate that, that exact kitchen, which I thought was great. Once the movie gets to Batman and the Michael Keaton Batman, it's a pretty fun movie. I, and I'll say it's like, it's sort of like, it reminds me, the film reminded me once it, once it gets through that slog of the first hour, it's like when Marvel was good. So basically DC made a, made an old school Marvel movie, very entertaining script, um, some clever twists. So it's a, it is a mixed bag. There's stuff that really works and there's stuff that's awful. The stuff that doesn't work is the, 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 the two berries, so to speak. Uh, but boy, Michael Keaton as Batman also just as a Michael Keaton, Batman fan, I freaking lost it. I mean, there's so many applause moments, lines, great stuff. And Michael Keaton just, he, he just dives right into it. And he's a recluse. He's at the end of his career. Crime in Gotham is basically solved. And, and he's a old man, long hair, beard. You don't even recognize him right in this, in this first scene. That's, that's in the trailer, by the way, once he puts on the suit, it's, it's freaking Michael Keaton, Batman. So I kind of lost it. And, and I thought those parts were great. Um, the woman who plays Akara, she's not, she doesn't, she, I don't think she's great, but she doesn't ruin the movie. Um, I know we were talking about uh, the sort of uh, lamenting the loss of sexy in films, but I'm happy, pleased to report the director of the flash is an ass man because there's an opening at, no, in a good way. So um, the, I mean, there is a lingering shot on Kara Supergirl's ass that is, I would describe as gratuitous and the opening scene in the film is, you know, Barry's just going about his life. He's, you know, concerned about an upcoming hearing involving his father might trying to get him out of prison based on new evidence that's that, that has come up. Uh, there's a, a justice league problem that needs to be solved. Okay. So Batman's off doing Batman things. Uh, Barry, the flash has to, to do, uh, he has to save a bunch of babies falling out of a maternity ward from a hospital it's it's actually pretty funny <laughs> ah there's babies falling to the ground everywhere Damn babies it. fall he throws one of the babies in a microwave it's it's actually really funny it, it, it's what? it's a funny scene uh <laughs> but, but that's where he discovers he can he can he it's possible for him to to go back in time a little bit but then they they end up uh seeing wonder woman at the end and there is a very gratuitous shot her skirt for a moment just lifts up and that's just wonder woman's ass i couldn't tell if she was even wearing underwear it was thank god to uh gail Godot there she uh wow so uh yeah so i'm saying that's a good thing that's a good thing uh i'm just glad you reported on that aspect of the film I was yes I, yeah. I that's a that's that's on my check box if you're gonna have a decent film is make it right no like, <laughs> i have to say like well done on gal Gadot, with. like God did a good job on Gal Gadot. <laughs> he I'm he really put the overtime in and he made a good one. But ult ultimately, like one, the this is what what's unfortunate about the film is the first hour kind of wants to be Back to the Future too, and and even references that Back to the Future was made in this universe, but with Eric Stoltz. In fact, one of Barry's college roommates has a tattoo of Eric Stoltz from Back to the Future on his thigh. Yeah. So uh, it's, which is funny. So I think that, look, I think it's a very clever script. I think it's, it's once it, it, the problem is it kicks in a little too late. Like it's, it's an hour to get to Batman, but once Zod arrives at this world, 
then then that's when um shit kicks in and seeing michael keaton do batman stuff with modern effects modern stunt fight choreography i mean really incredible fight choreography like we we'd not seen in the 89 batman which i thought was kind of weak when it came to that uh, uh the batman returns was okay but it's michael keaton full on batman and it's that's he's the best part of the movie so um and then and then and then Supergirl doesn't ruin it. There's no girl boss stuff in this. In fact, she gets um, I don't want to get into spoiler stuff, but you'll you'll see. Uh and, and and I so I I but the first half of the movie, I'm like, oh my god, I am not enjoying this. This is cringe, this is awful. And then the second half, I I I got I got sucked in. I got sucked in. There's there's an emotional thread of the mother, which which is kind of starts out a little stupid and then and then you know I, I i thought worked it worked for me so so that aspect of him trying to save his mother and then what happens when it comes to this multiverse my feeling is this will be the one and only multiverse film that dc will make and uh, while i won't tell you specifics there a, a lot of what's been reported in terms of cameos it's all there it's it's done in a way that like i will say this some of the cg is pretty pretty weak or borderline uh, you can forgive it if you're in, engaged in the story but the but the cg and the director there was so by the way i saw this at a fan screening so this was a fan screening i was not invited as a member of the press my buddy waited in line from 10 a.m and only six of us got in and we were in the front row at an imax screening the director had a video at the beginning saying this is not the finished version of the film so I'm hoping that the digital effects are upgraded and the movie just, just cuts off. There's about to be a big reveal. Barry is contacted by Bruce Wayne who pulls up in a car. You see a foot come out of the car. And just as you're about to see who Bruce Wayne is, because this is a multiverse film, which Bruce Wayne could this be? Uh, the film cuts to the director credit and the lights came on. There were no credits. So I saw an unfinished version of the film, which I thought was pretty brilliant because they did these fan screenings all across the, I don't know if they did them in, in the UK, but they did them across the United States. And I think, oh, this is how they're promoting the movie because Ezra Miller will not be doing any press for this movie. They're promoting right. it using fan. So I think that's very smart. It's clever. And not only that, they didn't show everyone the full film. So every single person, I promise you, who went to those fan screenings, they're all going to pay to get a ticket to see it. So I had a good time. I, 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 I'm probably more of a DC guy because I like my heroes taken a little bit more seriously. There were stakes in this film and I don't want to get, I can, I, I don't know how much a spoilery you want me to get drinker. I don't know if your audience will hate me if I get spoiled. Right, let, let's uh, like, all right, let's put it to a vote. Shall we like people with chats. Right. So if you want Chris to spoil it and go into some details, press Y, and if you don't want him to spoil it, if you want to just stay spoiler-free and happy and ignorant, press N. Uh, I await your response. Let's see what okay. they say. But if you have any questions, I'll answer questions. I think that like the, the, the cameos I thought were really clever, just as someone who grew up watching like the Adam West 66 Batman TV series and consuming every DC incarnation on film and TV, this this film really does a great job of um, showing you these possible multiverses. I, I don't I, like I say, well, you know, I'm not. I won't I mean, tell you any specifics. Just like just being a DC fan, it, it it delivers in that. It's it's basically and 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 the thing is, I think it. Some normies may be lost. That's okay. I think that's fine. You don't have to know all the references to appreciate them. You're going to know at least a few. But I had fun. There are stakes, and by stakes, I mean this. It seems in the modern Marvel and modern Star Wars, there are no stakes. You know, you can go and you can fix it. Someone dies, but they don't really die. Um, in this film, there are clear stakes laid out that uh, people will die and characters will not continue. And uh, that feels good for a change. Even if it introduces a multiverse concept, which is mm. kind of the big, like, escape hatch for that, right? Well, That's true, but my feeling is is this will be the one and only multiverse thing i mean this is why marvel's just been so flat like oh, yeah. where are the stakes they've already defeated kang twice so 
they'll defeat him again a few more times who cares Chris, I mean, Chris just just for I'm reference like, there's a whole bunch of whys in the chat I'd say the whys have it um, <laughs> oh, really? also there was one guy who just kept writing Zardos over and over again so respect <laughs> oh, I love that guy. yes and another like guy who said 69. Good. Like, <laughs> so, I say the yeah. next hour we spend on Zardoz. Fuck yeah, let's just talk about that. <laughs> There's something... The gun is good and the <laughs> penis is evil. Here's the big the big spoiler without getting too too specific that will tell you the tone of the movie and, and why I kind of liked it. Because if you th you you feel like there's this triumphant ending, but there really isn't because when it comes to certain things, certain things, and this is a conversation in the film, certain things are inevitable. Meaning, you know, Barry discovers he cannot save his mother. No matter what, he cannot save his mother. Not only that, he cannot save this world from Zod, General Zod. General Zod who roundly defeats uh, Kara, Supergirl. He's sort of cobbled together a half-assed version of the Justice League. It's, you know, Michael Keaton, Batman. You've got two flashes, one that's new to the powers that doesn't really know how to use them. One that's a bit more experienced, the Barry that we know. And then you've got Kara, Supergirl, who's just gotten out of this Russian prison where she's been emaciated, you know, kept away from the sun. So she doesn't, she's not sort of full powered. And um, they lose and they lose and they keep losing. And no matter how much they change the plan, they cannot defeat Zod. And it's tragic. And, this, and when you think about it- This actually sounds like quite a good story. I, mean, I, mean, I hate I'm, to say I'm, it, you know, but I'm kind of interested. I'm, I'm kind of like, yeah, no, this like, actually seems like they put a bit of thought into this one. <laughs> yeah, no, it's, and, and the thing, so what basically what Barry discussed, he can't save this world. It's, there are certain things that are inevitable and this world does not have a Superman. They have a Supergirl and a retired Batman, and that's it. And then a Barry who just got his powers. And it's interesting because they do pay attention to the timeline, right? So this is when Zod comes based on the year. So Barry knows this year is when Zod arrives at Earth, but it's different. Um, you know, you you. so it's tragic. And if you think about it, like it sort of ends in this kind of happy note because he gets back, quote, home to his world or... I, I'm not, and I'm telling you, I actually don't know because there's this reveal that's supposed to happen and I didn't see it. So I don't know. I, I can, I can guess it's not going to be Ben Affleck. Will it be Michael Keaton? Will they really cast that old for the Batman in the James Gunn verse? How is James Gunn? So I don't know who the Bruce Wayne is going to be revealed, but what I thought it was bold it's of gonna them. be fucking val kilmer or george clooney like that would be the ultimate punishment if he just ends that up in, be in like the joel schumacher batman universe it could be um, or it could be a new batman, it could yeah, be a new batman, be batman that was for crying out loud the, there was an interesting batman question that came up there chris as well like some people were asking do you get to see the christopher reeve version of superman yes yes a lot oh, really it's like yeah, all those things that you like, just think of everything. Uh, you <gasps> see the George Reeves black and white Superman. It's amazing. It's like, it's if you're a DC nerd, I mean, it's, it's, and the things because I was so close to the screen, and there's, there's a moment where these worlds are sort of portrayed as they're like crystal balls, and you see images, sort of tiny images in giant crystal balls. That's how they represent, that's how they visually represent the multiverses are different crystal balls kind of floating intersecting with each other and so i i'm certain that i missed some things because there's so much happening at once on screen so i'll see like oh wow there's like a george reeves superman there's christopher reeves superman adam west batman like and tons more stuff that <laughs> give us the nick cage one <laughs> uh would you like yeah. to know yes or no oh yeah tell us come on He's in it, and and oh uh, yeah, uh, that's so amazing. Good. But not just that; it's their production. Because I I saw that documentary that was done by um, John Schnepp years ago, "The Death of Superman Lives." They, yes, they took, like production drawings from that and actually recreated a scene. It's I it's, think it's, it's you know what cool. that you just saying that actually makes me want to watch this movie because it makes me think they they really had a bit of love for the lore behind all of this, and it. I think it's going to be such a shame because I suspect this film is going to bomb. It, it seems like they're messing around in a fun way. 
Seems yeah. like it's, like, it's fun, but I, fun. Because I think DC is at such a point, particularly this universe, like this version of the DCU that's just getting closed off now with this movie. People aren't going to watch it because there's no longevity to it now. Like, this is the end of it. And I think they might miss out on, like, the one genuinely good movie that we've gotten out of this universe. And that's going to be a shame. But, I, you know, even though they, they sort of, like, either through, you know, how music is, the way they use music in movies today is just shit. But it's like, they're basically mm -hmm. telling you how to feel, right? So you feel that there's this triumphant ending, Barry is, you know, the, the world is sort of back, so to speak. Although I, I didn't really, like I say, I didn't see who it was. It's, if you think about it, the events that he experienced are horrible and tragic. He, it's, it's horrific when you think that like, he basically doesn't win in the end. He doesn't win. He does not achieve his goal, maybe closure when it comes to his mother, but not the goal of, of bringing her back. So it kind of ends in this sort of like, hopeful happy way but if you think about what he experienced it's he basically didn't save the day so it's uh so that aspect of it like like i grew to like it it's just getting through that first hour to get to you know bruce wayne michael keaton bruce wayne batman getting to zod who's well he is the big bad there are other threats afoot i don't i don't want to ruin those what's but, uh, what's batfleck like in it He's really good. And what I like about it, the opening scene, he has a proper, like, cool Batman scene. Uh, you know, and he, the colors. So he's wearing effectively the, the version of the Batman costume from Frank Miller's The Dark Knight Returns, which is, I mean, that's a milestone in comics. I read it every year to just renew my faith in the medium. But, but also, it's the same colors, that gray and blue. And you've seen it briefly in the trailer. That's the version of the costume he's wearing so it's it's a fun action scene justice league action action scene that opens the movie there's another scene with bruce wayne he's not just a cameo he's in the movie for five to ten minutes so and he's he's used properly uh but it's uh, i have to assume i'm actually a flash fan i'm not an ezra miller flash fan but well, I, that's of, the, fair. Of, of the comics and everything i have to assume 90s flash guy and Grant Gustin, Flash guy, there's some reference there, right? Yes, I would have to assume, right? <laughs> well, that would be like too obvious. There's, oh my god, there's like a shot in there where I just I lost it. That if you're a Flash yeah. fan, you're gonna lose it. So, 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 I so, I, so it's it's a mixed bag. It's like this weird Back to the Future thing with Ezra Miller that you know that if you if you don't if you're annoyed by him, you know you're gonna. I don't know. It's like taking yeah. Rob Schneider's character and Judge Dredd and making him the protagonist of a film. You know, just like oh, I'm trying to think of like I'm, I'm, oh, trying to no. think of, <laughs> I'm just trying to think of annoying sidekick comedic comic relief characters. Like, right. like, but once it gets serious and you have a more grounding force, and Barry is balanced by you know retired old bruce wayne batman living alone at wayne manor because alfred has passed on like like it's tra a lot of this film when you really think about it is horrible and tragic it's kind of like eric stoltz take on back to the future which is why that you know he got replaced and didn't really get along with robert zemeckis his take was that um this is actually marty mcfly's story is tragic because he didn't get to experience you know life uh he didn't experience that other life so his take was to take it very seriously. Michael J. Fox was the more, you know, he, he took it with much more levity, a different tone. And uh, it, that's... It, it honestly feels like this movie would have been infinitely better if it was a Batman-centric film. Like, The Flash was right. just a vehicle to make that happen. Like, you know, uh, Keaton's Batman was the main character, or, or Ben Affleck's Batman was the main character, and he gets to see all the different versions of himself in all these different right. multiverses, and they have to team up to, like, overcome this this world shattering threat or something like that feels like that'd be a better movie. It <clears throat> The way you're describing it, it kind of seems like the main character is the weakest part of the film. True. Mm -hmm. But, it, but it's, how... Ezra, it's because it, it's, it's Ezra Miller. He's, he is a comedic sidekick and he's great as a sidekick. Once he becomes more of a sidekick and it's a, it's an ensemble, it's Michael Keaton. It's, it's uh Kara who I actually think is, 
she's decent in the film. And and again, she's not she's not going full girl boss. She gets her ass handed to her, um, you know, by Zod, who's a more experienced warrior. Uh, and and in in a way, this movie, in a way, this movie will retroactively make Man of Steel better, because the choice there's a, there's a controversial choice that uh, Kal El Superman makes at the end of Man of Steel that you can see. Oh, now I understand why he made that choice. Because it's other world lays it all the embryos. You talking about someone else? No, no. When when he basically murders, he kills Zod. You know, like it's That's like the oh, controversial right? choice. I mean, I've never like understood. bad guy who wants to yeah. destroy yeah. the fans. planet. I would say that was pretty justified. But no, no. I, I'm I'm just saying that is uh, uh, look in fan circles the the idea that Superman would kill is considered a, b- a bad thing. I'm just saying that um, it will seem more justified after this film because. We, you'll see. You'll see when. Uh, I mean, it's it's. If you really think about this movie after, it's tragic. It's tragic. I, I think it's a it's an interesting choice as well to bring back Zod as like the main villain. It would be like mm. I don't know, uh, making some multiverse um, storyline in the MCU and Killmonger is the no, not Killmonger. What's uh, Ironmonger? Like from the first mm-hmm. Iron Man movie is like the right. big bad that you got to defeat. It's like a guy who's just like been beaten so long ago that it's almost like people have forgotten about him now. Like yeah, again, DC just... fans seem to really like Michael Shen Zod. I think he was a little cringe, but I'm okay with it. <laughs> Kim coming back. The funny thing is, you just suggested I am fucking bring back Jeff Bridges into the MCU. Yeah, let him, <laughs> let him yeah, improv. Fun, Maybe something but... amusing will happen. How, how much do you suppose Batman's role was increased after they? Because wasn't he kind of supposed to be introduced in that piece of shit Batgirl movie that got canceled? Like, yeah. Yeah. do you think they expanded him after that was done with? Hundred percent, hundred percent. They they added more of him. I mean, there are fight scenes. There's like he he definitely is the leader. As soon as like they come, in. I mean, like Barry knows more because he's been to a different earth where he's been to a different earth that experienced Zod and that earth survived. So, but Batman is the clear leader of the group. And it's almost like Batman is saddled with two Robins effectively in, in the second half of the film. And that, and that dynamic works. I, I think that I don't mind. I know a lot of people despise Ezra Miller. It's, I don't mind him when he's with the, ensemble he's fine you know he's a or as Mahler would say he was fine <laughs> whenever Ma- whenever Mahler really loves something he basically says it was fine so that's just my experience of I mean uh, from what you said it sounds like I'll enjoy this thing what's um I guess I don't think it's too spoilery right but what is the context for all these amazing crazy references we're seeing is it's is like a portal scene like an end game <laughs> or is it some kind of yeah like when when he's going back in time, he can view these other versions of Earth, these other multiverses. He can see them when he's going through. To, and to go back in time, you know what he does? He runs backwards. Yeah, yeah, that's always been the Flash's thing. It, it's it's it runs backwards and turns into like a weird sphere, and then he can kind of see these other multiverses. So mm, that's yeah. it's 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 an interesting way to visually represent it. You know, I, I, I it, it works. I just think that some of the CG looked. A little sketch in some of these scenes. What's uh what's your expectation for box office, Chris? What do you think? I think this is gonna be huge because I saw it with a packed crowd of kids and uh and their parents, their parents remember Michael Keaton Batman. The kids don't care about Michael Keaton Batman, but kids like Batman, just in general, kids like Batman as a character. Um, I but it, my anticipation is this is a popcorn movie that is a crowd pleaser, and I think it'll do very well. So but, I mean, like, right. but looking at where DC is at as a brand, look at where superhero movies are at. Yeah, like the, the those two things combined, like people are getting kind of tired of superhero movies. They're kind of in their twilight years, and DC has like never been worse in terms of like their brand value. Like, do you think all of those things can still like? Can you still get like a, a billion dollar movie out of, of yes out of that? This is DC's Spider Man No Way Home. Because of because of Michael Keaton, it's leaning into that aspect of the nostalgia, and and truly, this is the Michael Keaton Batman from the '89 movie, the '92 movie. This is where he ended up. He fixed crime in Gotham. He's now a retired old recluse living alone at Wayne Manor. Okay, he never married 
any uh, you didn't marry Vicky we, um, or whatever. Do we see <laughs> Schwarzenegger Mr. Freeze at all? <laughs> No, no. I mean, oh, no. Here's, here's the problem. no, I, no, but I will say this. Like I, there were, there were certain shots where I couldn't see everything on screen. I guarantee, I know that I missed some things because they're, they'll cut to like a wide view of like the multiverses. And I'm li literally, my eye is darting across the screen screen, just trying to catalog everything I was seeing and looking for things that I might've missed. So I, and and I love that level of detail. I love so that I'm sure that there are Easter eggs that I missed. But you know, look, it's a popcorn movie. It's fun. Mm -hmm. It has the same problem as Spider-Man: No Way Home. Like it's a slog. But once you get to Tobey Maguire Spider-Man, once you get to Andrew Garfield Spider-Man, it's a fun movie. And the same problem here. You know, you got to get an hour in before the movie actually, you know, becomes what it's what it's I, supposed I just... to be. I, I love the idea of something like, you know, Schwarzenegger's Mr. Freeze interacting with like Christian Bale's Batman. That was yeah. so great. <laughs> That's the it thing about it. It's sometimes just like, just remove the pretense. Just have it happen in the first five minutes. Just go, hey, everybody, oh, here we all are. These are the characters. Oh, no, the time flema. And then lose the special effects. And then, oh, we're into the main thing now. It's just like, yeah, no one cares about the hour of setup to get to the stupid shit that we're all here. Well, of. a lot of the hour of setup is, you know, Barry, mom stuff. And some of the stuff with the mom is kind of stupid. I can't wait. Mahler's going to rip it apart. Like this opening with it's all, I it's all. To, uh, uh, no, Mahler, I love your stuff, <laughs> but it's, it's, um, you should be like a, a, you, I mean, God, you guys could all be script consultants. I don't know why. I don't know why Hollywood just doesn't have a group of nerds. They go to, uh, of course, I'm speaking of everyone on this stream, uh, but like c come to and say, what do you think of this? I don't know why they're test. I mean, you know, I think it's because we'd shit on everything that they made and be <laughs> like, no, just go by the drawing board <laughs> or at least script consultant. I don't know something. But uh, so Chris, you've got uh, you've got multiverses. You've got the DCEU. You've got the 1989 Batman. Does the thing feel like it actually coheres when you're watching it? Or is it something where you might as well just get stoned beforehand and enjoy seeing Nick Cage and babies in microwaves? Uh, well, I, I, you know, look, alternate taking mind altering substances before a film is always something that will improve it. Uh, mm -hmm. So uh, your mileage may vary. I would leave it up to you. But but uh, I found it once it kicked in, it was fun. I mean, there are like big applause moments from reveals and things that people see. And I heard some gasps in the audience. Like, uh, so I had fun. I had fun, except it's that, that it's, it's an Ezra Miller problem. And I feel like what's interesting is going to, it's going to be interesting to see how they promote this movie. Are they just going to put Michael Keaton on the talk shows or whatever, mm. or like doing junkets? Is it going to be Michael Keaton? I think they're leaning into the DC fans. Come see this. If you're a fan of DC, I mean, they're, you know, I, I really feel like in the trailers they're promoting it as not it's a it's a it's a Batman movie with the Flash in it, and I, I don't mind that. That's a movie I want to see, and it's a proper you see kind of you know you see Michael Keaton's Batman character has maybe a different story arc than other Batman, so to speak. But if you're a dude from the Midwest and you don't have a particular depth of pop culture knowledge and stuff, is any of this going to make sense when you see it on the screen? Yes. Yes, because you're you'll, you're aware of like Christopher Reeve, Superman, Michael Keaton, Batman, all that stuff. You know, you don't need to know everything. You don't need to have read Flashpoint to be able to enjoy this. I mean, it, you know, it, it's it's based on that. I mean, uh, you know, with a lot, a little variances, a lot of variances actually. But but uh, I don't know. I I had fun by the end, but also like I, it's also like been. I mean, God, the Marvel movies. With the exceptions of Guardians, which I thought was was good, uh, again another movie that all, all those movies can be thirty minutes. Should, uh, make them all under two hours. Jesus, yeah. like my God, it's it's and they'll be tighter for it. You know, they'll just be better experiences. Um, but I but uh, a friend of mine did see a longer cut of this. He saw a test screening about a year ago that was two hours and forty five minutes. He said that cut was much better. Hmm. That cut of the movie. 
I guess the pro the problem I have with all this like superhero Star Wars stuff, you know, when you're putting Lizzo and Jack Black, you clearly don't care about your audience or don't take it seriously. And what I like about this film is it takes it it takes the events that are happening serious because worlds are at stake, lives are at stake. There are true stakes, um, life and death stakes. And I don't feel like with anything Marvel, there's no life or death stakes anymore. There just isn't. And so why do I care? People get, you know, stabbed with lightsabers, lightsabers in the chest in the Star Wars universe, and they're fine. They didn't cut off one limb in the Star Wars sequels. That was sort of a Star Wars trope, right? You know, somebody has to say, I have a bad feeling about this, and somebody's going to lose an arm or a leg, and good, that's fine. You know, and the fact that that didn't happen once in the Star Wars sequels is um, stupid. Well, you right. couldn't have Ray like lose a fight and get injured like that. That's just no. That would be great. Oh, wow. That would be great. You do a disservice to um, young girls who watch this. Yeah, there are stakes. You play with lightsabers. Someone's going to lose a limb. Someone's. It would have been great if they had like a bite. I think you would have liked Ray as a character more. You know, if she suffered some consequences for her badassness or her, you know, just being so overly confident, you know, that's what was cool about Luke lost a hand and Darth Vader was toying with him. Wasn't even, you know, being full Vader. At that oh, point. I love that. It's, it's a crazy it. idea. Like the, a character who comes through adversity, like might, you know, build on themselves. Like they might actually develop a little bit of, uh, um, you know, um, character building through their right. experiences, but no, nah, you know, well, look at the we first don't need that anymore. Look at the first Indiana Jones film, Raiders of the Lost Ark. He has a series of wins. He loses. In the end, he loses. He doesn't get the Ark. He loses. And he loses is, a lot in the film, to be fair. He, he uh, does lose a lot in the film. Uh, that's interesting. And mm -hmm. it would have been interesting in the Star Wars sequels to have a Ray that was had to that suffered, that had to fight, that was that there was some resolution with her parents that we never saw. I fucking hate the Star Wars sequels. I hated The Force Awakens. I fucking, that's why I'm doing uh, on my, and you're all invited, by the way, uh, to appear on, I'm doing a show called Critics Court, Star Wars on Trial. And we're putting Star Wars on trial for the murder of the Star Wars franchise, <laughs> in which we're, we have prosecutors and defense. I will say the defense has put up some very good arguments. So I would like to invite you all to, um, think, and the, the viewers are very. We we could all be your star witnesses, I think, on this one. I would I would love to have you guys on, but uh, Where did Disney yeah. touch you? <laughs> yeah, <in fact. laughs> yeah, we're gonna have witness. We're gonna have like uh, impact statements. Of people who were, <laughs> but no, look, the Flash. I think it's gonna be it's gonna get mixed reviews because I already saw someone talking about it, a reviewer online, who didn't like. I mean, it, it, if you really think about the tragedy of the third act, it's fucking dark as hell it's uh pretty freaking dark so i've seen some some negative comments but i think it's overall going to be a popcorn film that will uh that will please audiences and there's there's a lot of opportunities to applaud and and just sort of celebrate your love of all things dc superhero related yeah, yeah, yeah. Kind of, I, I think you're right it sounds like their attempt to do no way home yeah it is it is yeah I mm -hmm. think the way you've described it, like I think if the if DC had been a successful franchise at this point, this movie would have done amazing. I think this would have been a, a really interesting like exploration of the multiverses and stuff, and I think <coughs> they, they could have done some of the really um, you know they would have done big numbers with it. As it stands, with DC as a, a franchise like that that's kind of died out and uh, it's in the midst of like a reinvention. And this represents like the final dead end of like the original like vision for DC. Mm -hmm. Man, I just I I can't see it doing big numbers at the box office. I just I I feel like it's going to go down the the same path as Black Adam. I don't know. I think it's going to have good word of mouth among normies because and 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 Flash is a bigger character than Black Adam too. <laughs> yeah, and it, look at look at the way Shazam. Yeah, but Ezra Miller is not a bigger star than The Rock. That's very true. Like, very true. See it. No one's going to see this movie for Ezra Miller. And if they are, it's out of morbid curiosity. Not not because Ezra Miller is a star. Uh, but look at look at Shazam 2 and how it failed. Uh, deservedly so. What's the point of that movie? 
Shazam is not going to be <laughs> doing anything forward. What were the big, if anything, they should have not made a Black Adam movie and just put Black Adam in Shazam 2. That would have been a more interesting film. Not going to say it would have been a good film, but much more interesting. Uh, but, but you know, I think I think this one will do well. I think Aquaman 2 is going to tank because nobody cares and Amber yep. Heard. And then, and then, the, but, but the thing that I'm very curious about, because I didn't get to see the end credits, the sort of post, there are clearly some surprises that were saved for that. Um, how this gets us into J the gun verse, how this gets us into, to James Gunn's universe. Cause, because clearly, because it ended, can I just say like, okay, so a friend of mine saw a test screening of a, of the a version of this that was two hours and 45 minutes. He said it ended differently. Jeez. It ended with Barry seeing Bruce Wayne and Henry Cavill Superman on a view screen somehow. And they say, Barry, what have you done? And then it just sort of cuts to black. So apparently he fucked things up. Who knows? Uh, but that's not the way that this is going to end. Maybe okay. maybe an excuse for <clears throat> them basically having an all-new canon now with the Gunverse, probably. That's probably what Correct. that's about. But the, how is this going to set up a new Superman, a new Batman, or is Michael Keaton playing Batman in The Brave and the Bold and it's about the Robins, right? Isn't that what he said? It's like an older Batman. And I don't know, man. Like the, that, that announcement by James Gunn I thought was premature. I yeah. thought it was not exciting i thought i thought he made a huge mistake especially because i've actually attended san diego comic-con and been in hall h when they do those big it's like a rock con it's like a concert right like it's people going nuts i saw when uh, they introduced like the justice league jason momoa gal gadot ben affleck uh, they're all on stage and um Ezra Miller was there dressed as Princess Toadstool talking about smashing the patriarchy. That guy, uh. is, in real life, he's a freaking, <laughs> he's just a weirdo. You know, he's a weirdo. I mean, a what? Someone who acts weird, who's on their own time in Hollywood? That's like a Tuesday, you know? But like yeah. the fact that he just like, oh, it was, and you could tell that they're all on stage going like, well, that's Ezra for you. He just acts mm -hmm. like a weirdo. And, uh, whatever but like yeah okay. james Gunn's announcement i thought was lackluster and i don't know how he threads the needle of the old content getting it the old sort of you know what's left you know on the corpse of the snyder verse uh you know and and then get into the gun verse what does he do you know he unceremoniously got rid of henry cavill which i think was a mistake but you know i don't know how does how does he set all this stuff up do you think there's going to be an element of they're going to sit back and wait and see what this movie does, what the feedback is like on it, what elements did well and what didn't, and they're just going to incorporate that somehow into like their new universe? You would think, but you know, James Gunn apparently has an eight-year plan. I, I don't know if I believe that, uh, but I, he did. He was instrumental in in mapping out. He has executive producers. I just, that, I just um, think that this like incredible like optimism that superhero movies are still going to be a thing eight years from now <laughs> yeah nobody's yeah, gonna right? give a fuck man yeah i agree i don't think I, look i don't think they're going to be making a flash too and i think that has to do with ezra miller not the box office of this and i think anyone that you know even if this is a north a billion dollar movie does that mean they're going to make a flash too no i think they'll recognize that the star of the movie was michael keaton batman i think that's that's the reality hmm yeah. In the span of a year to have films with um, Ezra Miller, uh, Amber Heard, and Jonathan Majors in them, the studio <laughs> executives have had a lot of sleepless nights. They must feel like they've like walked through a, a minefield and then just right. got to the end and looked around. How did we manage that? Yeah. Up next, exactly. Black Adam 2 starring Bill Cosby. Let's see. Yeah. <laughs> Round of applause. It, may, <laughs> it makes me wonder what the fuck chance Aquaman 2 has got because... This feels like closing out of the the DCEU. The it does. DCEU. Yeah. So like you've then got like the Aquaman two going like, hey, I'm still a thing. <laughs> <laughs> like That's gonna be hilarious. at the end of the That's year Blue when Beetle. nobody's nobody could possibly give a fuck about it. <laughs> Don't forget Blue Beetle, Drigger. Exactly. Blue Beetle. Oh, yeah. Oh, Christ. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, uh, yeah. I think that's gonna tank, but. Uh... But, you know, it, it does sort of, it is concerning because Blue Beetle is supposed to be part of this 
the Snyderverse or was supposed to be Aquaman two. Apparently, it's terrible. Uh, everyone that I've heard um, about it, like it's just the the word is it's just god awful. So how do they even save it? I think they'd be better off releasing it as an Elseworlds thing on HBO or HBO Max. What a stupid thing to change it to Max. <laughs> I'm, trying to up, I'm trying to look up max deals just google max deals uh yeah, look right. it up. nothing related to max it was much easier to google hbo max deals i would have found HB, something hbo was always the brand name like that was yeah, the thing that people so were associated with it yeah. what a and stupid stupid decision what, i've seen people complaining about it as well isn't there something like you have to download a new app to transfer over a or something, new app. yeah people are not happy about that either <laughs> That just but seems with dumb the, and just yeah. With Aquaman two, like with Amber Heard, you're literally watching a crazy person who, in, in <laughs> yeah. literally in the court of public opinion, was exposed as a crazy person, and that's the yeah. person we're watching on screen. It's what are they so supposed wild. to do? Chop her out of the whole film? <laughs> <laughs> they could. You know, you know they've been... just Batgirl it. Batgirl it. Sweating over, over that. Again. This whole time, they've been trying to figure out what to do with that chopper out, keep it. Remember, mm. this film got delayed like crazy, right? The Flash because of all the yeah. Ezra Miller shit. Mm -hmm. yeah, Not only that, but like I, I don't that, and like they just didn't know what to do with it. Well, yeah, well. I think right. a studio and chopping it all to pieces, like... putting it back together. Yeah. Well, it yeah. sounds like from what Chris has said that they have like a thousand post credit scenes that they're just switching in and out to see what works best. <laughs> no, exactly. I mean. They could even change it up. I mean, if you recall the original Avengers, mm -hmm. they added a post credit scene after the world premiere. They thought, hey, we're all together. We'll go shoot it. Didn't they shoot it like that night? They're like, I've got yeah, an idea Chris, for a scene. Chris Evans isn't even there. They got a body double for him. He's got his fist Jesus. on his face. You can't see him. Yeah, it's uh I thought that was that was pretty brilliant. That was a fun that was, that was one a of really the, fun scene, yeah. Yeah, it was a fun clever post credit scene so they could in fact add a post credit scene to this maybe that's why they're doing the fan screenings so early three weeks in advance of the release they're doing these fan screenings which are free by the way you just have to register on some website and then show up ungodly early to even have a chance to get in because the lines have been crazy and that tells me because i was following on social media like oh wow a lot of people i knew who were at other screenings didn't get into those screenings the lines were insane I think that tells you that there's interest in this film. And, and I'll say, just having seen the trailer in, in front of other movies with audiences, the Flash trailer gets a very good reaction. You know what gets zero reaction? The Marvel's trailer. No applause. <laughs> I forgot about that. <laughs> Nothing. It's just dead on arrival. But I don't see why you couldn't take Amber Heard. I mean, with deep fake technology, you could put Harrison Ford's face uh, on, <laughs> on her character. Yeah. Uh, you could deep fake his face. I mean, who cares, right? Like, yeah, I, don't I just know want Mister Freeze put on everything. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> man. <laughs> also, my bad. He, Chris Evans was there. He just had to cover up his beard because of Snowpiercer. So that's yeah. why he had the hand up. Yeah. I forgot. Uh, yeah. Yeah. I like uh, to think there's there's a there's a, like a, a existential realm of deleted digital content somewhere. Like by a portal, you can access, and there's Bat Girls and Willow swirling around, just like some kind of weird purgatory. Like uh, like at the end of um, um, that the in Beetlejuice is that afterlife scene. And I just imagine there's digital content swirling around and around like that, which is all I, I could, deleted. I could definitely imagine that. Um, but we were talking about Marvel there. Like the the most successful movie that they're likely to have in this entire phase has been Guardians of the Galaxy Volume Three. That's currently sitting at six hundred and sixty seven million worldwide, and that's Ooh. nice. It's now been out for three weeks. Um, realistically, it's not going to do a huge amount more at this point, and like now that it's getting superseded by, um, you know, things like uh, Fast Little X. Mermaid, yeah, Fast X, <laughs> Little Mermaid. You're gonna have um, you're gonna have indie coming out not too not too far away. Um, uh, it's pretty much run out of steam. Um, you know, that's that's not even really reaching the break even point for this thing. Like, it's probably gonna have to get about eight hundred million just to break even. That's that's a ways to go yet. Yeah, I, I think I think the thing is is that DC here here's my impression is DC is at least trying. DC is recognizing that they have issues. That's why they brought in Gun. DC is you know whatever you think maybe a fresh start is the way to go with Superman. You need one good Superman movie. I, I'm of the opinion that I don't think that Gun. If you look at his movies, they're all like these ensemble 
group of weirdos and obscure comic characters, uh, with all due respect to a, a polka dot man, um, you know, he's good at that. He's good at that. He's good at making you care about a character you've never, you're not familiar with necessarily. That's great. We're well familiar with Superman. And, you know, Zack Snyder couldn't necessarily nail the tone. So is Gunn going to do much better? And, and, and also we could use a Superman movie now. I mean, if, if people, people don't remember, but I was alive uh, when the first Star Wars came out in the seventies were a horrible time. It was a dark post Nixon, post Vietnam, uh, horrible economy and inflation. It kind of reminds me of now. Um, we're living through a dark time. What could we use? We could use something hopeful. We could use something optimistic. We could use, you know, we can't, we're not getting optimism from any leadership whatsoever. We could use some optimism and positivity and, and hopefulness in our entertainment, something better to aspire to. That's not what Marvel's been giving us. And, 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 and it doesn't look like we're going to get it at all in this phase or from any of the people that they're choosing to hire. The fact that like James Gunn couldn't get hired at Marvel now tells you something because James Gunn has a deep knowledge of comic books and is well, if you've ever read his book, the, the novel, the toy collector, I recommend it. Um, but well, if uh, you're not but, getting optimism from Marvel, Chris, then you've got to do better. <laughs> you've got to step up. <laughs> yeah, but like, but it's, no, I it, it's, wonder though, like, uh, you know, the way the superhero genre is going, it seems to be ebbing. So in five years, are people going to want to see Swamp Thing and Booster Gold? Hell yeah. yeah. <laughs> I, I think I, like I characters know. like Batman and Superman transcend just yeah. trends at cinema. Like they're always going to be popular. You're so you always going to have Superman, Spider Man, Batman, maybe X Men, right? Like the big guys. You're always going to have, and that but yeah, that's, like the, the idea that you true. can. Look at every other film trend that's died out. Westerns died out, but John Wayne and Clint Eastwood didn't. Right? They kept right. making movies until John yeah. Wayne died. Um, so the big guys will still be around even when the trend goes away as a rule. John Wayne's Genghis Khan was a heartbreaking performance. <laughs> what? No. It was yeah, unique. Put it that way. <laughs> really took the wind out of him. Anyway, so let's continue. They need, they need anyway. to bring back those Clint Eastwood monkey movies. Remember remember when he was yeah. every which way but <laughs> loose any which way he can? Clint Eastwood oh, God, with an yeah. orangutan. Yeah, but it was yeah, like was right turn Clyde. <laughs> yes. Uh, I but like but my point yeah. about this, the, my point about uh, movies of the '70s is they were dark, and and also I think the 1970s was the last great era, the '70s and '80s, last great era of American filmmaking, where there was a truly American identity to films, and it was also a dark era. And Star Wars and super, movies like Superman stood out against that. They were hopeful, optimistic. They were they were fun, and and. God, we could use that now. The the Marvel movies are just, I don't know, man. Like they're they're going down a path that they just, I kind of feel like because a lot of the people who actually do the writing, they don't. Um, you mentioned earlier the wine mom writing staff from She Hulk, but I, I'm talking about like the the just sort of the the darkness of the the writers that they choose to hi choose to hire. My hope is is that this WGA strike will end up in some sort of French Revolution or a purge in the sense that a, a, a lot of people that really probably shouldn't be writers or aren't as experienced will just go back to, maybe they'll go to culinary school. Who knows? You know, just yeah. a more stable job. So um, there you are. I was going to, I was going to start doing some super chats, but before I launch into that, I know Chris, you're, uh, you're almost out of time, unfortunately. Um, I don't yeah, know if you've got time for run. a couple of super chats or if you want to bounce just now. Um, uh, uh, if there's any that are directed at me, I'll answer a question or whatever. So I'll stick around uh, for a little bit. I will see what I've got here. Um, yeah, I'll maybe just start from the beginning. And uh, yeah, I'll do a few and then we'll see how you're getting on. Um, okay, cool, cool. Dougie Schmidt says, as the Snyder Burst just about wraps up with The Flash, what's everyone's favorite aspect of it? And why is it Hans Zimmer's eargasmic Superman theme? Yeah. Um, I mean, I, I, I think there's many. I don't think there's many big Snyderverse fans here on this yeah. panel. Gee whiz, uh, did I enjoy um, the idea 
of I sure of loved that AstroTurf bring back the Snyder Cut campaign. That was completely yeah. organic. <laughs> he hmm. he did some action scenes that were okay. Can we could we say that? Like you, you can say that. Scenes. Yeah. It's just everything <laughs> else that underpins it just gonna fall apart. Plus, lukewarm and lackluster response to a question. <laughs> yeah, I'm gonna feel bad now. <laughs> uh, this is this is a serious question from from Chuxenhausen, and he, he we know because he says serious question. How is mm. Movie Bob still alive? <laughs> I think his absolute hatred for humanity probably sustains him. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Can we be sure he's human? I don't know. Is he still a thing? Is he still? Yeah, doing he's stuff still around. He's still threatening to kill everybody. It's something he does uh, a lot. Oh, nice. Uh, Waylon Decepha says, "Come and see or Saving Private Ryan." What would you do, or what would you prefer? Wait, what was the first one? Come What's and come see. And see? Oh, I feel like it's another war movie. Hold on. Oh yeah, that's that like, super uh, bleak nineteen uh, eighties Russian one. Yes, Jeez. yes, a Soviet yeah. anti-war film. Uh, yeah, uh, yeah, so, yeah. Set during the occupation. I, I watched that and I actually felt physically exhausted afterwards because it was so bleak and so draining. So I guess I'd go Private Ryan on this one. Yeah, <laughs> I haven't I seen Come and See, so I can't really say. It's yeah, one of those same. weird films. It's like you know, it's become infamous. Sorry, infamous, but like half of us have never seen it or never even mm -hmm. heard of it until it's been mentioned in these super chats. It's a weird one. Um, DC7000 says, Do Disney hate Star Wars due to its past success? Is that what they've done? Is that, Sorry, is that why they've done a ham-fisted attempt to get a wider audience, or are they just terrible at doing this? Got a question. Does Disney hate storytelling at this point? <laughs> It's. I think they, they bought... They, yeah, I, I talked about this a little bit in my kind of Walt Disney uh, video today, but it was like... I think they tried to, they tried to build like basically buy their way out of a possible bankruptcy scare in the late aughts. Like Disney were kind of on the ropes for a while there. People sort of forget in the early aughts there was a lot of oh what's going on? Michael Eisner was sort of he entered early refirement as it were, right? And they weren't really sure what was going on with the company. And I think they picked up LucasArts or LucasFilm rather. Well, they picked up both. But um I think they thought that they were healthier than they really were and it needed more repair work than they thought. And um, their idea of repair work is, Hey, let's fuck it up even more. And uh, I, I honestly think that's just where they're at. They're not really suited to fix what problems already existed in Lucasfilm. Not really. Uh, Stephen Bobo says question for razor fist. What's your opinion on the armored core series? Since you're a big mech warrior fan. I like it. I like Armored Core a lot. I'm excited about the new one. I'm I'm really digging the fact that FromSoft are going to make something other than a Souls game. I I, I think it's boss. <clears throat> Ambient Space Noise says we now have Drinker and Razorfist streaming together more, but uh, when will Critical Doggo and Cicero cross over? Also, Razor, how does it feel to stream with your favorite battle mech, the one and only Mauler? Yes, <laughs> that's true. <laughs> that is my favorite battle tech mech. <laughs> hey, nice. Uh, Asher Dale says, "What is the breaking point for Disney? In 2022, they were carrying 45 billion dollars in long-term debt while only making three billion in net profit. The parks can only offset the losses for so long." Good point, actually. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I mean, I think what if in Indy Five could be a, a kind of a breaking point for them because, damn, that movie cost a lot of money to make. And, and that, never mind getting, whatever. Oh, oh sorry, sorry. Closer, sorry, man. Uh, getting closer to like the American national debt, where you get to a point where it's never going to be paid, so just let it run. <laughs> like uh, Netflix and Disney, who's got the biggest ratio of debt? I wonder. Yeah. Right. I think and as soon never as mind. Avengers. Uh, whatever is going to happen with Florida and and Disney and uh, the whole Disney World thing, like God knows how that's even going to resolve or if it is. So that's kind of a big question mark. That's probably a big reason why, if you've looked at their stock price recently, Disney's not doing so great. <laughs> it looks like the Matterhorn for Christ's sake. I was going to say, as soon as an Avengers movie only makes about seven hundred, eight hundred million, they're going to be like, uh "Oh, are we actually dead?" 
like for that entire IP. <laughs> it's like, yeah, it's gonna set I in mean, with a couple of bigger failures, you know. I mean, you, you look at it like, what have they got at their disposal now? You've burned through all the goodwill around Star Wars. None of the new Star Wars movies are gonna turn a profit. Um, the Marvel films, the only thing that they had up their sleeve was Guardians 3 and that's a marginal success at best. Everything and they don't really have Spider-Man. Yep. Um, what else? Like, Well, their live action remakes the way it seems to be shaken out um, <laughs> yeah, like Little Mermaid doesn't seem like it's going to be a huge hit Indy 5 is going to be a flop like, oh mm. man. I don't think no, they're so I'm sorry, oh, go ahead uh, I don't think those Star Wars movies that were announced are going to happen. I, I just don't think they're going to happen. No, I, I think I, agree. I, 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 I think that uh, well, when you look at the number of projects that are Star Wars movies that have been announced that didn't happen, uh, it's yeah. a long, long list. You can, you could, mm -hmm. I mean, Tom from Midnight's Edge made a graphic just listing all of them, and it's kind of insane the number that have been announced. My feeling is the only one that will happen is the Dave Filoni one, and it'll be a directed. Disney Plus event film, right? The one with Thrawn, which is effectively a ripoff of Heir to the Empire without Luke Han and Leia, Orlando, which is stupid. Uh, they that should have been the Star Wars sequels or some version of that. But I don't. I predict that those aren't going to happen. I think Kathleen Kennedy has two more years on her con contract through 2025, if I recall correctly. Is that enough time to? Because the thing is, is she can announce whenever she wants. She doesn't have the money to do those things. She has to get money from higher ups. And and so I my prediction is none of those movies will will happen. I feel sorry for Daisy Ridley. I don't I think she's fine as an actress. I actually think she's I think she's, you know, she hasn't said anything overtly stupid and and I think she's fine. Uh but um she was done wrong by that character was done wrong by everyone around her. And I think she knew it. I think she knew it if you see the her on the last Jedi press tour. She kind of knew with that, like, oh my God, what have I signed up for? And she hasn't been able to do any work since. So yeah, she got typecast cool. bad. Exactly. So look, that happened to Mark Hamill back in the in you know the seventies and eighties, right? Like, what work could he get? Right? He's not. Well, here look at what happened to Hayden Christensen and Jake Lloyd and whatever. And after well, that's the true, he got but, jumper. All right, but those those actors <laughs> make a. Saw it. Right, but those actors He's got make Obi Wan fortune. Kenobi. Oh. Well, those oh. actors make a fortune at uh, conventions. That's where they make a ton of money. So, mm. look, even Gina Carano makes a ton of money at those things. And you know, <laughs> somebody <laughs> said Corvette Summer. Sorry, right? Well, <laughs> but Honestly, look, though, look, uh, I, just I just don't think those Star Wars movies are going to happen. I think it's it's going to be a Disney Plus movie event. They're going to make a two hour USA. movie that's going to. First of all, I think it's going to be horrible, but uh, that's what it'll be. It'll be a three-hour thing, or they'll turn it into a mini-series. They don't, you know. What, I mean, we're seeing now, like how much it costs, and and the Marvel brand is less tarnished by uh, than Star Wars is. And look at the problems that they're having at the box office. Okay, yeah. their best that's movie, their best movie is going to come in what just over seven hundred million worldwide. Yeah. Their yeah. the, the best film, Guardians Three. So. Uh, there, I, 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 I don't think there's anyone there that's willing to be honest enough or willing to take the risk and, you know, fire a woman who has objectively done a terrible job. So, yeah, absolutely. She'll get, she'll at most, I've said this for a long time, at, at, at most, she will get promoted. And, but because through her promotion, she'll be taken away from these franchises, right? That's what happens to people like Kathleen Kennedy. They get, they fail upward. They make they more, upward. but, but it's the only way you can get their tentacles out of whatever project yeah. you want to get them away I mean, from. I think she's, she's what, pushing 70 now? I, yeah. I could imagine a retirement where they just, yeah. you know, they give her all the accolades of like, oh my God, she was like the biggest tr transformative force in Hollywood for 40 years. Like we all owe her everything. Uh, and then she just kind of fades off into the sunset, like, and just... They'll ignore all the damage that she did to to everything that Lucasfilm was involved in. 
I, I imagine the the, uh, the Galactic Star Cruiser Hotel being empty out and turning into like the Overlook Hotel with Kathleen Kennedy just sitting at a typewriter. <laughs> yeah. right, so. but that's the thing, though. She doesn't give a fuck about any of this stuff. I don't think she gives a shit about Star Wars or Indiana Jones or any of it. It's just stuff to add to her legacy. In her mind, I think that's all it is. It's like, I'm just going to put my stamp on all of this stuff uh, and then eventually move on. And I don't care if it's it's good or not. Like all I care about is my public perception, my legacy. That, I think the, that's um, all it comes down to. Out of the three Star Wars movies that they announced, right, the the first Jedi versus the the Mandalorian movie in seven years versus the Ray movie, I cynically believe the Ray movie is actually the one that's most likely to happen. Unfortunately, <laughs> I feel I like they so might too. fast track it. Um, mm -hmm. And quote unquote fast track it right get more I, announcements in like a year's time or whatever. I think the the Filoni one will be the one that happens to tie up all the the Mandalorian and well the thing is TV as much as I stuff they've got going on because it's the most relevant. They've packed so much bullshit into the Mandalorian already that I can totally agree with that. It's just that isn't it supposed to be in seven years? That's the plan. Yeah, they'll they'll bring it forward. I think <laughs> just to wrap everything up. I just don't know what things look like by then. Mandalorian's already lost a significant amount of favor. I, I think yep. they know. So, like, if and they put out a that, season but, four and no one you know, cares, the, the like... Prof... Oh, sorry, sorry. The, like, not only that, but, like, the whole profit model of Disney+, Plus, like, right? They're, they've been losing subscribers like crazy. The... <laughs> Even if you're losing viewers on some of these shows, it doesn't really matter as long as you're gaining subscribers on your platform, right? Because that's just kind of the weird kind of profit model of streaming. That's not happening with Disney Plus, right? So, so the Mandalorian being unpopular and them losing subscribers is really the <laughs> the problem. So I, I don't. I, I, I think you're it's right. So weird. If you're like a soulless being counter type right now in Lucasfilm talking about Star Wars, you might just be like, you might want to scuttle this IP. You've ruined it. It's over. <laughs> like, you can't make money right? from this. And it's so like, yeah, but it's Star Wars. It's like, yeah, I know. I don't know how you did it, but you did it. Because I don't know I don't know where to take it to guarantee money right now. Absolutely. Probably bring I... um, the Clone Wars li movies live action with fucking Ewan McGregor and Hayden Christensen. That would probably get you some money still. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, let me do a couple hey. more here um oh real quick from... can i, I, yeah, I yeah. if i could just take off uh drinker oh, I gotta, yeah, I gotta, yeah. actually i'm going to see the little mermaid pray for me pray for I, me. I can't <laughs> wait to hear your thoughts on it chris oh god all right well i'll be talking about it tomorrow you poor unfortunate soul <laughs> Tomorrow it's Sunday. hilarious, right? Like it's like, oh, Phil, don't we love it? It's just Chris explaining all of his miseries. <laughs> like, just... Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Well, mixed bag this summer. But uh, thank you again, Drinker, for inviting me. Uh, always a pleasure to join you, Mahler. Uh, great to be with you here. Echo, good to meet you. Razor Fist, yeah, I don't know. If that, big fan. Uh, can't wait to see your Western comic. Saw the preview on FNT. That looks freaking badass. Cannot yeah, wait you. for that. Looks really good. And you're all invited to appear in court uh, for Critics Court uh, on Wednesdays, 1 p.m. Pacific time. Check it out. It's We're trying to do like a real courtroom setting, putting Lucasfilm and Disney on trial for the murder of Star Wars. So subscribe to Film Threat. And thank you, uh, Drinker. When I'm, not, when I'm not on the show, I'm watching the show. So Thank you, man. Last, last um, week's was great. Last week's was great, man. Oh, yeah. It, that was it, good for you. Uh, awesome. Yeah, like the link to um, Film Threat is in the description, so please give Chris a follow uh, if you haven't cool. done already. Mm -hmm. but, uh, Thank yeah, you, I'll... and I, I hope I didn't ruin The Flash too much for everyone. I know you <laughs> wanted it ruined for you, so there you go. <laughs> there are plenty of other surprises. I didn't ruin everything. I can't br blame you. Come on. Good, good. Yeah. All right, take care. I'll talk to you soon. Thanks again. See you, later. Later, Chris. See you. Uh, later. Catch you later. All righty. I'll do a few more Super Chats to finish this up um jeffro maddox says aquafina was perfect for scuttlebutt they even made a comment in the original tight uh, sorry the original little mermaid about his singing voice sounding like a bird dying uh, i think that's <laughs> sounds, sounds like aquafina yeah Why are you complimenting aquafina at that point come on yeah uh slack attack says at this point seeing indie Five is equivalent to attending a funeral. I choose to remember him riding off into the sunset with his dad at the end of Last Crusade. Yeah, Ooh, that's how it ended. Couldn't just leave it the fuck alone, could they? That was a perfect send off. I the think I'd, I'd, I'd happily 
end it at the refrigerator at this point. I mean, <laughs> take that. They just got boiled alive inside it when the nuke went off. <laughs> <laughs> the, the sad thing is just the predictability of whatever is the dullest, bleakest outcome is the outcome that happens. What's the new Star Wars film going to be? It'll be Ray coming back. Is Indiana yep. Jones going to be fun? No, it's going to be him and he's old and cynical and there's a young female sidekick who knows everything. Whatever is the dullest likelihood or option is going to be the one that turns out. Yep. Those are the thing uh, with, um, we've talked about before, but Back to the Future, it's like, what would a new one be? It's like, Doc Brown is hailed as like a monster who destroyed the world almost by the whole community. <laughs> Marty is like this old man who lives in the distant part of the town because no one trusts him because he's a crazy man who can't be, you know, mm. and he comes in to give some advice, but then, you know, the main character teaches him that he was wrong in the original trilogy, and what he really did was fuck around and nearly kill everybody. You're like, okay. Yeah. <laughs> and <it> is, <laughs> Why not? Here I... yeah. And Marty is a uh, aging mentor to a black lesbian time traveler, right? <laughs> oh, yeah. and his uh, his playing the Chuck Berry actually turns out to be a kind of cultural appropriation. That's uh, right. That's yeah, he must be stopped. <laughs> uh, Adino one says, "Just want to mention the passing of the great Ray Stevenson, who made the best of every yes. role that he was in. Please consider doing yeah. a drinker video on Rome." Yeah, I'm so about to do Rageolic Cinema on Punisher Warzone. That's going to drop probably in the next week. So had to. I love his that's, Punisher. That's the one Punisher I've never seen, but apparently it's considered the best. It's great. It's really, really... You it's basically it, right? the di the director looked at... She had never done action, right? It's Lexi Alexander, I think. And she had never done action or anything. So she took a, this, a look at the script didn't know anything about any of it and she was like oh this is death wish so she just made death wish 3 the superhero right. movie and it's amazing it's an 80s <laughs> action movie that just happened to be made in 2008 it's incredible <laughs> nice rome is in a category in my mind of i remember it being exceptionally good and i don't want to revisit it just in case it isn't as good mm. as i remember oh That's rome is fantastic it holds up I a lot it. of fucking, a lot of nudity, a lot of killing, <laughs> just everything yeah. you need in life. 90 minutes of tits. That's what we need. Yeah. <laughs> We've learned from this. Yeah. Taker610 says, can't wait for EFAP's 50th anniversary stream coming this <laughs> August. Mora has promised a 168 hour live stream. Are you in, no. Drinker? <laughs> just, well, yeah, just a constant. We can barely live call together 24. We're all dead by the end of it. Yeah. <laughs> I love that. It's like, oh, we couldn't do a 24 hour live stream. You know, it's really difficult. Like, as if that's some kind of failing. Like, Jesus, <laughs> can't, even get out. can't even get through three. Um, Waylon Becepha says, RIP to my grandfather. Survived World War II and escaped communist East Germany. Tough old man. Anyway, gents, I hope that you're having a great week, better than I am. Cheers. Uh, well, I'm sorry to hear about the loss of your grandfather, man. Um, yeah. It's, uh, by the sounds of things, he had a good innings, though, if he was around in World War II. So, uh, yeah, my my sincere condolences. Um, Kathleen Kennedy's Kill Squad says, <laughs> All will bow before the House of Mouse. All shall love our content and despair. Feeder <laughs> Waller Bridge has been dispatched to your location. <laughs> Why is she a thing? Why did why do Hollywood executives think this Phoebe Waller Bridge is a thing? I why don't do they keep know. trying to make her into one? Because outside of the UK, I don't know what the fuck she's done that even Americans even are, are interested in her. Yeah, it's like she's kind of like here. It's kind of like when we tried to make James Corden happen. Like it just Ooh. it's just one of those things. It's like we that, just get dedicated to someone. Yeah, this is the, the the only thing I can relate it to. It's like every so often Americans just seem to fall in love with a random British comedian. Like it started yeah. with Ricky Gervais, then it was James yeah. Corden, and now it's Phoebe Waller Bridge. I don't know and why it, you guys do it. But right, it and, and the worst part is it was like James Corden succeeded Craig Ferguson, who is legitimately great. Right? We already had a really good guy from the UK. What the hell? But there was no load that he could sink to that would uh, destroy him. He could do cats. He could do that weird dance uh, in public outside the cars that was caught on TikTok or whatever. Uh, uh -oh. Nothing could uproot him. Was, I couldn't understand. He was never funny in any way. No. Strange. 
Um, got a two three one nine says uh, drinker. You keep saying my name wrong. Don't know. Don't you know Monsters Inc. reference when you see it? Also, who wants margaritas? I'm pouring them heavy. How am I meant to say his name? Like, am I Wait, missing something? Name? Uh, got a two three one nine. Uh, twenty three nineteen. Got a twenty three nineteen. Twenty three nineteen is the code they give when uh, a piece of human anything touches the monsters. I feel weird uh, that I know that, <laughs> but that's fine. Yeah. <laughs> fucking child. That's when Pixar were fucking great once upon a time. Okay. I have <laughs> never felt like more of a boomer. I did not know that. <laughs> Angry Batman says, as much as I should hate Fast X, I loved it. Just shut my brain off. There was a touching part where Dom talked about making a better world for his son, which really got to me. Go away feelings. <laughs> I mean, they they are heartfelt movies. They are dumb as fuck. <laughs> they know it. But there's there's a little bit of like sincerity to them, I feel like. There's an earnestness to the Fast yeah. and the Furious movies that just takes me back to the 2000s. And I don't know, man. I can't help but like them just a little bit. <laughs> call me, call me like, naive if you want, but uh, I don't know. They they do have a place in my heart somehow for all the stupidity. Um, Unhinged says, I wasn't able to gift last week uh, for you and Mauler's 50th wedding anniversary. Well, sorry. <laughs> uh, so here's something a little bit more. Uh, buy yourself some cheap vodka. Thank you. And Haunted. we will, believe me. Uh, RRTNZ says, Dodge, duck, dip, dive, and dodge! Doesn't dodgeball deserve a drink or recommends? Yes, it does. Uh, alliteration aside, RIP, Calculon, and cheers to you all. Oh, thank you. Uh, appreciate it, man. Uh, Blue Ball Spare says, Hail to the panel. Uh, here's some cash to enable drinkers' alcohol enthusiasm. Thank you. Also, wondering if you happen to see Count Dankula's video on Aussie comedian Isaac Butterfield. If so, what are your thoughts? I haven't seen that one yet, actually. Is that a new one? No, I haven't seen it, so... Yeah. It might be. Is it another Mad Lads? Well, Isaac... Uh... I thought he tends to go for Mad Lads that are like... That's like a YouTuber, isn't it? Isaac Butterfield as well. Uh, yeah. I mean, he's done ones on, like, uh, Dragon Lord and stuff, so... Yeah, but know, Dragon Lord is special... <laughs> He is very special, yeah. Uh, yeah, I'll need to look that up. But yeah, I haven't seen that one yet, I'm afraid. Um, Blue Ball Spear also says, RIP Ray Stevenson. Yeah, very much so. Um, Andrew McCarty says, Cheers, thoughts on Rocky IV versus uh, Rocky the Drago cut. So I think, uh, yeah, they did like a recut version of Rocky IV a year or two ago. I, I think they um, put in a you know, a few deleted scenes and stuff like that. Uh, haven't seen the whole thing. I saw, like, the, the revised fight between Apollo Creed and Ivan Drago. I thought that was better, actually. They gave Apollo a bit more um, of a fighting chance against him. He got to do more. Um, I hope that they took out the robot. From it. <laughs> Why? I hope so. Keep the robot. <laughs> yeah, it was an interesting one. But, uh, yeah, I haven't seen the whole, like revised version but i'm interested to look actually see what it's like have you heard uh, about this blade runner white dragon cut that the guy's working on oh christ there's another cut of blade runner well it's a fan thing it's a fan right thing. putting so in the, a bunch of just... stuff from like restoring a bunch of stuff that had been thought lost like scenes that were in sequences and stuff that were supposed to be in the movie they weren't even in like the work print or whatever um, but yeah, apparently like a pretty wildly different version. It, it's it hasn't come out yet, but the guy's putting it together, I guess. Some guy in like Japan or something. I mean, has there ever been a movie that's been more fucked with than Blade Runner? Right. <laughs> right. I don't know of any film that people just can't leave alone. Even the director <laughs> just keeps going back to it. It's true. It's weird. Like, yeah, you, you did pretty good right off the bat. Like, you don't need to keep messing with it. It was fine. I'm fine with the theatrical cut. I've always been fine with it. Is the theatrical one the one with the narration? Yeah, it's got the that voiceover. The uh, okay, that's not a great one. voiceover. Yeah. Not a great voiceover, but well, I like Harrison it. Ford not fucking hate it, and he he tried to give his worst performance so they wouldn't use it. Yeah, they, have you so, heard yeah, like well. the outtakes of him in the in the recording booth, like literally all but calling the guy directing his voice performance like a cunt, like just <laughs> <laughs> that exists. Wow. 
Amazing. Hear that. It, like, is, it is peak cranky Harrison Ford. It's fantastic. I love it. He was like a cranky old man even when he was young. It's great. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, what's the next one? Uh, Joey Foots says, uh, do you think they made scenes in The Little Mermaid so dark uh, so they could call people racist for saying this movie is too dark? <laughs> <laughs> And we do have to worry about like the just the visual acuity of the whole thing. Like if, if the the surroundings are really dark and you've got a, a black actress, like are you even gonna be able to pick her out from the background properly? Like yeah, it's feels like we're it's kinda of like what they did with Tinkerbell in the the new um Peter Pan and Wendy. Yeah, why where... did they make that so gloomy? Like Neverland is supposed to be a wonderful fantasy realm and they just made it uh, like windswept kind of northern island aesthetic it just strange yeah, it just like bleak i don't yeah. know it reflects the lack of in imagination in, amongst the writers i suppose yeah. um gray says one minute drinker you're ruining the uk's reputation what oh that was uh me uh, me being one minute late starting so... ruining the reputation i don't think so there's not much to ruin we'll be fine <laughs> yeah no one respects us so it's okay <laughs> Shiny Monster says, Drinker, you loved Arcane and Puss in Boots, and so do I. What are, when are you reviewing Cyberpunk Edge Runners? Oh, yeah. Um, I like that as well. I just haven't got around to doing a review of it, but yeah, overall, I thought it was a pretty good show. I liked it. Um, Iron Bean says, Happy 51st anniversary. Thank you. Um, Samuel the Infamous says, This Saturday will be the 50th episode of my show, Screaming Into the Void. A belated grats to you on yours. Thank you, man, and uh, good luck with yours. Yeah. Uh, the Opal says, I'd rather dip my buttered up balls in a pool of starving piranhas than watch Indy 5. I don't blame you. Hmm. <laughs> Sir Mauhaus says, Drinker, did you say last week that your favourite chapter... Uh, were the Blood Angels. Mine too. If so, uh, I have a model of Commander Dante arriving tomorrow. Nice. Um, yeah, I'd probably take the Blood Angels. Um, yeah, the Ultramarines are just like boring and, and just like generic. Um, the the Dark Angels are a bit too like emo and broody and the Space Wolves are just fucking werewolves. <laughs> like, so. I like the Blood Angels. They were quite cool. Uh, I don't need. I don't know if uh, balls need to be butted up in order to absolutely attract the piranha. I think right. they'd probably go for your balls regardless. Yeah, yeah. right. Maybe I... the, the butter is to get them going faster. I don't know. I guess you'd probably want to put barbecue sauce on them or something to really get them going. I would think. Yeah, uh, I'll do a couple more and then finish up. Uh, Timothy Finch says they managed to stretch the five second scene of Ariel getting her voice back into over a minute. No wonder all these remakes are always a half hour longer. Yeah, it's just, uh, there's there's a lot to be said for efficient screenwriting, and we just don't have it anymore. Uh, Silk Crayfish says, did you guys see the gun interview where he said that he met with the Russos and approved everything that happened with the Guardians in the film? No, That's what not. I always thought that the reality was. The thing about it was, uh, when I saw Infinity War, I was like, damn, like the Guardians were pretty solid. And then I remember reading, it's like, oh yeah, it's because James Gunn was consulted, so the characters were you know, taken on properly. But in retrospect, it seems like James Gunn hated what they did with uh, his characters in Endgame and Infinity War. So yeah. it's, uh, I'm not sure what happened exactly. I was talking to, um, I think it was Gary about this, but uh, it's something that Fringy brought up, but it's just really interesting to think about. Rocket Raccoon has been with presumably Hulk, Thor, etc. for five years and without the Guardians for five years. You wouldn't know that from watching Guardians 3. No. No. It doesn't does there's just no effect of that at all, and, and it, to me, it's James Gunn being like, eh, "Fuck that, I don't care. I'm, I've got my own story to tell." And it's like, "All right, man." Uh, the Justice says, uh, "Drinker, I'd love to for you to have a good faith conversation with Destiny. It would be nice to see you talk with someone who's critical, but also not a five IQ moron fishing for dunks." Uh, I don't know. I mean, could you have a, a good faith conversation there? I mean, maybe. He does think the sequels are better than the prequels, so you got a lot of Ooh. you, know, you got to try and help him out. The bridge. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's just like, is that worth my time? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Could I really be bothered? <laughs> Not really. You gotta, you gotta help him out. You know, you gotta get him through those easy hoops first. Yeah, then... I mean, that's that's a long way. I've got to lead him towards sanity. I don't know if I've got the time for that. 
uh mercy lago ai says if south park showed spielberg and lucas boning indiana jones then kathleen kennedy has indie chained and gagged in a joseph fritzel style dungeon it is insane <laughs> it is insane to think the south park were making fun of how indiana jones was raped with the fourth movie You're like yeah. i know <laughs> It's 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 so quaint to look back on like movies like The People versus George Lucas. <laughs> like it's like, oh sweet summer child, if you had any idea how much worse it's going to get. This is the thing. Are we gonna look back on this time now and be no. like, oh my god, we didn't realize oh. how good we had it in twenty twenty three. Now I, we're dealing I, with Indiana Jones seven. I hate that concept as much as I hate the people who are like, just give it 10 years and TLJ will be considered a masterpiece just like Empire. It's like, no, no it won't. <laughs> no, it won't. Keep coping. Uh, T1S says, hey, Wall, more. do you think you'd ever do an unbridled video uh, for Kenobi or one of the other disastrous Star Wars shows on Disney Plus? If we do the TV episodes, like breakdowns like that, we I tend not to do like a video on it afterwards. We got... You got the full reactions there. That that just feels like the extensive discussions on how fucking horrible Kenobi was. But it's easily a a, a project that you can make a video for. That pissed off everybody. I think in retrospect, mm. I don't think anyone really likes Kenobi at this point. No. You get tweets that are like, "I loved it when Anakin said, oh, my master, you you betrayed me,' or whatever." It's just like, yeah, yeah, just all it hit the regular beat, but. I'll never get over some of the fucking insane choices they made throughout that. I love the uh, Kenobi grabbing his strength by thinking of Leia under the rock. Uh... Like, it, like of <laughs> you get you get the uh, the little montage. It's like picture of Leia, picture of Leia, picture of Leia, picture of Leia, picture of Luke, picture of Leia, picture of Leia, picture of Leia, picture. Of Leia, picture of Leia, picture of Leia. It's like what the fuck? <laughs> Every so often I think of these things, I just want to reach for this. <laughs> right. <laughs> God damn. I'm still haunted by uh, by the death of Wade, that, uh, yes, that fighter pilot. Wade. Oh no, still, Wade. still haunts me. I'm just the one good thing that came out of that was uh, Uncle Owen. I just thought, yeah, he made a brave stand against he a did. strong female character, and mm -hmm. like he knew he was gonna lose, but he did it anyway. Uh, Uncle Owen took a blaster Owen. rifle like to that. a Sith. He was like, "I'm gonna fuck you up. <laughs> like, <laughs> I'll try at the very least." I just can't get over that little girl making fun of the show as well at Star Wars Celebration or whatever. So it was, <laughs> yeah, that's just brilliant. Based I'm just as amazed as they managed to fuck that up. I mean, every, it was all yeah. teed up for him. And yep. It's like. Uh -huh. Just make a Kenobi anything. We're there, and they're like, yeah. "Oh, really?" <laughs> it's Disney for you. They actually managed to just stop themselves from making money all the time. They burn the fucking register, the printer. Well, they're, 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 I've said this before. They're like a reverse King Midas. You know, everything <laughs> gold that they touch turns to shit. Right? Like, like they, they should have the easiest <laughs> slam dunks ever, but they still find a way to mess it up every time. It's amazing. Your reverse yeah. Midas should turn gold into regular things. <laughs> they turn gold into shit means they're just a horrible Midas. It's like the <laughs> way You're a bad <laughs> Midas. Oh. More like a gold into copper like kind of conversion. And then they salt the fields after just to make oh, sure yeah. nothing grows. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and then they wonder where, where it went wrong. They're like, I don't understand. <laughs> what can we have they, done? They had a goose laying golden eggs that just lays eggs now. Yeah. Uh, James Boucher says, and I, I guess this is for all of us, are you a fan of Taylor Sheridan's work? Um, overall, yeah, I'd, I'd say I do like his stuff. Uh, I enjoyed Tulsa King. Um, I've liked Yellowstone for the most part. I haven't seen 1923 yet. Um, yeah. I do think it's kind of funny that like he wrote himself into his own fucking TV show as like the most badass cowboy that's ever lived. Um, but yeah, fair enough. I don't I don't begrudge him a little bit of ego. Thing yeah. is, in Harrison Ford in uh, in the 1923, he's only one third of that show, and then you got these other two thirds of the show, which is completely different storylines. So yeah. You know, yeah, yeah. But overall, yeah, I, I quite like his stuff. I think he's doing some some decent writing for tv at the moment so yeah i'm all right with that and and he's done a few movies too didn't he do sicario or something like that uh he, oh, did he, he, did, that? he did some movies before he did that um and they were pretty good or are supposed to be pretty good yeah i love sicario i thought it was awesome yeah. i did not yeah. like the sequel i haven't seen the sequel yet still Don't. haven't uh, yeah who's it focused on is it Benicio del Toro's? It is, but uh, I don't want to get into it. I hate that fucking okay. movie. <laughs> I'm, just, I'm too sad <laughs> to talk about it. It's too sad. <laughs> Go watch the first one, though. It's fucking great. It is really good, yeah. Brolin in it is fantastic. Yeah. Um, 
Anyway, I'm going to finish up there because we've been doing this for a, quite a while now. And um, we got through quite a bit of the Super Chats as well. But uh, I want to say thank you to everyone who sent in these these awesome Super Chats and all the, the lovely people in chat. And for my awesome mods who've done the usual fantastic work that they always do. I really appreciate you guys. Um, and I really appreciate the generosity that everyone's shown as always. And um, especially I want to say thank you to my awesome guests that have come in tonight. Um, Echo, Razorfist... Uh, and Chris Gore, who's no longer with us. I don't mean he's dead. He's just kind of gone away. Uh, <laughs> the yeah. dearly departed Chris Gore. Yeah. <laughs> uh, great to talk to you, all you guys, as as always. Um, really appreciate you giving up a couple hours to do this. So thank you, guys. Um, yeah, well, uh, congratulations on the on the 50. And uh, if you do another 50, uh, Russell Crowe will probably be interviewing you. <laughs> yeah, as long as he doesn't fight me. <laughs> um and yeah well razor you've uh you've got your comic that's uh is coming out pretty much now isn't it oh sorry graphic novel yeah um the campaign just wrapped up and we're in full production now we raised like over a quarter million on it it freaking blew past anything we expected to do and uh yeah it's like a kind of a spooky we, you were talking about unforgiven uh earlier it's kind of a pale rider unforgiven sort of like elemental western and uh, yeah, I, I think uh, your viewers will dig it. Nice. Yeah. Bring on the Iron Age, man. Like, this is the kind of stuff we want to see. Like, independent creators just doing their thing and, like, getting the support that they've earned, you know? So, no, I wish you the best of luck with that, man. I hope it's, well, it's already been a massive success, and I hope it goes on to even bigger and better things. Yeah, I'm excited because the Westerns are all coming out at the end of the year, right? They're all greenlit, but the movies haven't come out yet. So they'll come out around the same time as our comics. So I'm interested to see like if that affects how well the comic does. I don't know. I'm just excited because I've already read it and it's boss. Nice. All right. Well, thank you, everyone. And uh, well, I guess that's all we've got for today. So go away now. Bye. <laughs> Bye. Got the paid.